Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Were you whistling at me, Mr. Real? I was whistling to mimic the lady who was whistling at you in the pre-recorded intro there. Oh, wow. That's great. Bill, I'm so glad that you could be here tonight. I understand you've had a whirlwind weekend. Yeah. Went to uh, Sunday weekend. afternoon. Say that three times fast. Sunday afternoon to visit uh, John DeLynn in Salt Lake City. Uh, we did nine hours of Mormon story style interviews. I actually, I can't wait till this comes out. I'm super excited. Uh, and then uh, last night, there was a dinner that was recognizing, I guess, an honorary dinner in, in my honor, which was not humbling and humbling at the same time. Yeah. It was a long time coming. Too long, I say. Too long. Somebody's got to have one of these big things for John himself. He's the one that does it for all of us. We got to have one for Mr. DeLynn. Mm. Okay. Well, we'll start working on that. Maven, yep. take a memo. <laughs> uh how's life treating you great better than i deserve by the way maven may not be able to join us uh she's here she's in the uh the background doing all the things that make the show run but she's in a situation where she doesn't have enough what's the technical term for it is it like um what is it help me out bill she doesn't have enough bandwidth that's it bandwidth Thank not you. enough upload speed yeah right the upload speed. That's the problem. Oh, we need to make an announcement besides the fact that you just got honored finally and very deservedly. And you. Amanda, your wife too, for that matter. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. She's made a lot of sacrifice over the years to let me do this. Yeah. Yes. It was always better that she was the one handling the kids anyway. Probably. Yeah. Oh, I saw that sly wink. Okay. <laughs> we were, we were going to make an announcement totally unsolicited about Thrive Women's Conference. Had you heard about this, Bill? Uh, I have now. This is Thrive Women's Conference 2023. This looks like it's June 2nd and 3rd. It's and this it's Friday just... and Saturday. Today yeah. is May 31st, 2023. So this so is like this just Friday a low price. $35 yeah, to women's... 60 Oh, excuse me. Yeah, yes. please go ahead. You went right to the amounts, didn't you? Yeah, that's my, I'm, a, I'm a tightwad. I want to make sure that uh, I'm saving money, and this looks pretty cheap, so I think this is a great time. So one day ticket for $35, I guess tickets for everything is $60. So you save money by going to both. They've got a bunch of great people who are going to be speaking. It looks like they're featuring Samantha Shelley. You know her from Zelf on the Shelf. Mm -hmm. And then there's Gabby. Oh boy, it's A-C-O-R-D. I'm going to try Accord. Mm -hmm. And she's an LCSW, which means something really important, but I can't remember what it is. Do you know what that is, Bill? LCSW? um social work yes i yeah licensed. yes licensed clinical social worker I there think. we go i think we pieced it together between just the gonna clothes. double check it yep licensed clinical social worker that's correct okay and you can find all the information you need there oh by the way yep. did we mentioned where it is it's at weber state university in the shepherd union building apparently weber state is located in ogden and that's in utah right bill Yep, and I just put the uh, URL address where you can get your tickets into the comments of the live chat. If you're watching this after it's been published, you'll just want to look at the live chat off to the right instead of the comments down below, and you'll be able to, at this timestamp right here, look over there and you'll see it. Actually, okay, perfect. 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 Okay, so please get your tickets, go there, support the Women's Thrive Conference. I will not be there because I don't think I'm allowed in. You've got the wrong parts, my friend. No, no. I think men are allowed and even encouraged to attend. They've got Anthony Miller's going to be speaking for crying out loud. Look at that. Anthony Miller. I just saw him last night. He came to visit uh, for the program. Oh, that was so That's good. so nice. That's yeah. really nice. So the reason I, I'm not there is because I, I live about 800 miles away. I totally understand it. Um, I think you did one of these once before, and I don't think I was there. So, Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Perfect. So, you know, now we're even. <laughs> All right. So have we said everything we need to say at the get-go before we launch into tonight's amazing episode? 
Let's do it. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited. All right. Well, here's the thing. Most people who listen to this know that I went on a mission to Japan back 79 to 81, November to November. My first missionary companion in Japan back in January of 1980 up in Fukuyama was Kyle McKay. Watch your he mouth. was my senior training missionary companion for one month. I think that's all that he could stand of me. No, actually, I thought we got along very well. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. He certainly used to be. And based upon the things that he is saying now, you know, I think he's still the same kind of guy. He's a good guy. Um, you know, he's just the kind of guy that you want to hang out with. He's very cool. And some of the things that we'll talk about tonight, I think, show that he's still that kind of guy. He's just got this really difficult job because he is the church historian. And so my missionary companion was, is now the church historian. And his missionary companion is now Radio Free Mormon. It's a small world. But he gave this talk at BYU Idaho on April 25th of 2023. That was a Tuesday. And I'd been through that talk and broke it down in a prior episode. But what I did not know until a certain individual reached out to me, who we have as a guest on the show tonight, and his name is Joe. We're not going to be using his last name because of certain reasons. And I think we all know what those reasons are, even though it seems ridiculous that we have to have these reasons. But we do because those are the games, those are the rules by which we play in the LDS church. If we're going to say something, you know, that may be not totally in line with things and we have relatives or whatever reasons there might be, we want to try and do things in order to not identify ourselves completely or easily. So Joe contacts me. By the way, that game is fair on the other side too, because in the SEC report, it seems like the church also didn't want itself to be identified. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Good point. Well put. But Kyle, Kyle McKay, the church historian, before he goes on Tuesday, April 25th to BYU, Idaho, he shows up the previous Saturday in Joe's living room. And the church historian is there to answer Joe's questions about church history. Joe is a former seminary teacher. He had a crisis of faith, which I think that he would more describe as a trust crisis with the LDS church because he dug into stuff and he knows his church history, I would say very, very well. And I want to bring Joe on and have him be able to explain to us where he's coming from and how on earth it happened that he got the church historian into his living room for an hour and a half to be able to talk about anything Joe wanted to talk about in terms of church history. There he is. Hey, Joe, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Is it too late to back out of this? Are we? No, no, you can back out if you want. We'll yeah. just go on without you. We'll so anyway. just go on without you. Joe, this is fantastic. Um, I don't know how much you want to say about yourself. I've already said that you were a former seminary teacher, and I think maybe that was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. When you stopped being a seminary teacher, is that right? Yep. How long were you a seminary teacher before that? 14 years. And it was amazing. 14 years. Yeah, I I do not have a single complaint of my my time with SNI, CES. Great relationships, great memories. And SNI means seminary and institutes, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And CES has a whole church. letter named after it now. Right. That's how that's how most people know CES now is because of the letter. But CES means church educational system. And that's right. the stuff that you're under as you work as a seminary teacher, right? Correct. Okay. Anything you want to tell us about your experience as a seminary teacher? Um, sure. Well, I, you want me to do like, my, a, like a full background introduction of myself? Or do you want to just talk about seminary for a second? Just seminary for a second. I tell you what. Just to let the audience know, we have got a, an, a slam bang show for tonight. And my concern is that might mm-hmm. go long. So I had talked with Joe about just giving a thumbnail, five minute introduction of himself so we can get into the main part of tonight's show. And I think my questions may be interfering with that. So Joe, just tell us about yourself in your five minute thumbnail introduction. Okay, so let me, uh, let me manage expectations. Um, I... Uh... I'm super nervous, so if at any point 
RFM said he was going to bail me out and Bill said they'd bail me out and say really intelligent things. But I have prepared just I know it's coming in under five minutes. So first of all, uh, return missionary um, served a, a worthy two year mission. Amazing experience. Loved my mission. Um, I was married in the in the Salt Lake Temple to an absolutely amazing uh, human being. Uh, cool little note. Uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell performed that temple ceiling for us, which is pretty cool. So that's been a while ago. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, he uh, he was late to the ceiling. And when he got to the ceiling, he was dressed in his um, like in a dark suit, not in his whites. Mm. Um, and he was in a sling. He had been playing tennis that morning um, and it injured his arm, gone from the tennis court to the doctor. And that was when they re-diagnosed his leukemia. Um, and so he came from the doctor to our our temple ceiling after just receiving that news, which was, he was extremely gracious. It was a wonderful experience. Wow. Um, and then uh, I became a seminary teacher for 14 years. Uh, like I said, it was a great experience. It opened up lots of opportunities for me to, to continue to learn church history to do that kind of stuff, um, which is, was a hobby before. And certainly, unfortunately still a hobby today. Um, it was awesome. Uh, while I was a seminary teacher, I pursued uh, a master's degree in educational administration. I always kind of thought that being a, a school administrator would be a really cool job, um, especially working with, you know, some of the knuckleheads in school. I was one. It's my favorite, favorite uh, population to work with. So that was You're always in the You're talking about the kids now. Mind. You're talking about yeah. the kids, the knuckleheads? Um, on a good day, the kids are the knuckleheads. Yeah, they're the ones that I like working with. Um, the knucklehead kids. Um, anyway, so I got my, my master's degree kind of as a backup in, from seminaries and institutes, just in case you ever want to go a different direction. Um, throughout my seminary teaching um, experience, I was always very aware um, of some of the thorny issues, some of the, the non-flattering issues. And I never, honestly, never had any problem. Um, I could do the mental gymnastics. I could understand. I could, whatever it was, um, conflicting doctrines, conflicting whatever. I, I was able to, to manage through it. Uh, about 10 years ago or so, I, uh, I was in Southern Utah driving down the road with my kid, turned around, came back, didn't know which road to take. Um, that's a joke. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the wrong road revelation. Um, but I had my <laughs> own version of one. Uh, I, I had what I felt, um, was pretty confident was, uh, um, you know, inspiration from the Holy ghost. Uh, like many of us, you, you, get, you get to a point where you go, well, that didn't plan out or pan out the way I had thought or whatever. And you start to kind of do some introspection um, between that and a few other situations that I was looking into with regards to the Holy Ghost and watching some people around me um, with regards to things like um, um, just the ability to, to recognize the spirit. I... Uh, I started to uh, determine that there just was not a reliable way to differentiate between my own feelings and the Holy Ghost, um, which caused me um, kind of a crisis of confidence in my position and in a lot of areas of life. Um, and if, if you're not sure you're feeling the Holy Ghost, um, you're, you're, pretty, uh, you're pretty impotent as far as your ability to, to teach, to lead, um, to be in those positions of authority. And uh, as a result, I, uh, I stepped away from seminary and uh, jumped across the street, literally, um, to, uh, to public education. I taught history, and then uh, I'm now sitting uh, as, a, as an admin at a, at a school. I, I can look out my office, and I see my old seminary uh, office window. I can look every – I mean, I'm directly across from it. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a bittersweet, kind of cool um, – I, I still have a great relationship with the guys across the street. Um, I still have very good relationships inside of seminaries and institutes. Um, anyway, so uh, through, you know, that uh, that process, I started to evaluate some of my previously held beliefs differently because I received, you know, confirmation that these beliefs were, were true because I had the Holy Ghost and you remove the Holy Ghost pin and everything starts to kind of to change. Um, so I, I wrote some things down. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah. Uh at some point, if you're like me, and I think you are, you have to grapple with the issue of the Holy Ghost, which testified to me of many things about Mormonism, 
But then it also testified to me that the stories that Paul H. Dunn told were true. And then I find out that it's not true, and I have to go back and reevaluate my spiritual witness that they were true. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I had uh, someone once come to my home, shared the story from Elder Holland that he shared at missionary um, president meeting, you know, the, the, with the dogs in California and the, um, and the biker gang. And, oh, yeah. and my first, my first uh, red flag went up because I had heard that story years earlier from the first person from Elder um, Clark, who was the BYU-Idaho president. Kim he Clark, was telling right. that same exact story in yep. first person. And so all of a sudden we hear it from another person. I was like, well, that that's strange. Um, and then turns out that both of them were wrong. But regardless, it was interesting because the person who was sharing the story with me was was truly touched by it and was bearing testimony of how the Holy Ghost bore, bore testimony. Um, and that was another one of those things that you just kind of reevaluate. But so here's here's what I wrote down. This is not long, um, just so I can get my words correct. Um, I said, here we go. As a result, I left the seminary program. Um, and I began a complete deconstruction and then reconstruction of my faith. As Patrick Mason would describe it, I was cleaning out my truth cart. Over that 10-year period, I studied the gospel and church history as intensely as I ever did as a seminary teacher. Most of my life, my testimony of the church rested on two pillars, truth and goodness, with the truth pillar providing the primary support. It wasn't long before it became more and more evident that the dominant narrative um, just isn't what we thought. It's just not true. You're going to quote Bushman, aren't you? Someone, someone said yeah. something like that. Um, but so at the end of that experience, I realized that the only thing left in my truth cart was just, you know, a couple of apples. There's just not, there's not a lot that I can really base, um, uh, you know, a faith tradition on top of. And so I shifted my emphasis from the importance of truth to the importance of goodness. Um, you know, it was, is the church good? Is it a good place for my family? That kind of stuff. And that's what right. kept me going to church. That's what was, you mm -hmm. know, put, put me in the, in the pew on Sunday. Yeah. Um, after continuing studying, um, especially how the church responded to its own history, um, and then how they responded to the people, the historians and the writers who wrote and talked about church history, you know, the B.H. Roberts, the, the you know, the um, D. Michael Quinn, um, how they treated these people at these times, um, that caused my other pillar to start to erode. Um, and it got to the point that over the last year or so, going to church um, just felt like I wasn't being authentic. It felt like um, it was dishonest. Not that anybody in church was dishonest. I've never had that thought. That's not my that's not my point. But me sitting there in a Sunday school class, listening to these conversations, biting my tongue, whatever it may be, I felt um, like it just wasn't it wasn't tenable. So um, not long ago, I just stopped going to church. Um, and I never, I never worked through this with anyone um, other than my spouse. I talked with her, um, but I've never, I mean, I listened and read and did all that kind of stuff, but I've never expressed doubts uh, in public um, or to anybody who was a, a believing member. Um, so that brings us to right here. And then I'll just read this real quick. And then I think that'll lead us into this week or this uh, story. Any Let me questions? bring up this because your wife has stopped going to church as well. She um, very recently. So she has not attended sacrament for a while, um, but she did still have a, a calling that she um, she did fulfill her calling. And so up until just very recently, um, she was still um, faithful in fulfilling that calling. And we've got a great ward, um, a great stake, uh, people who are good friends, very supportive, um, just great relationships. You know, when, when a people great stake look, president. Phenomenal stake president, truly. And are you related to the stake president in any way? Um, by marriage, distantly. Um, we'll get into that here probably in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, so some people talk about how, you know, the LDS church doesn't work for them. You know, the privilege. Um, I, I really can't think of anyone that I've ever met that the church didn't work as well as it has worked for me. Um, mm -hmm. It just and that's not arrogant. That's just I was in that privileged population. It was amazing. And it's still a great experience as far as some of that stuff. So, um, so, you know, why did I create a document? What happened there? How, how did I meet someone? Um, well, uh, I had a, uh, um, I had a moment where, and I'm going to come back to my reading so I can say the right thing. Um, the spring, my stake president, who by the way, is a great stake president, um, and also is my father-in-law. Um, he stopped by and he asked if he could bring Elder McKay 
to my house. Uh, he the wanted church to historian. Me. The church historian. And how cool is that? I mean, honestly. That's cool. Um, you know, for so many people in the world uh, or in, in our faith that struggle, um, there is no lifeline thrown to them. Um, and in my situation, not only is there a lifeline, but with a legitimate um, source of of knowledge. So, I, I mean, I couldn't – it's the kindest – act that that a state president and a father-in-law probably could have done under those circumstances um so uh to help organize my thoughts and facilitate a discussion with with elder mckay i put together a document and the document for the most part i uh you know for a couple of days i was like yeah he can come visit that'll be great and then i started to think i probably need to write something so one night i just pulled out my laptop started to type um and stopped when I was about 30 pages into the body of what I was writing. And I realized, oh my gosh. Um, so then I, I, I sparsed it down to about 10 pages. Um, and then I've got some random, not really necessary appendix that I stuck in it. But so anyway, I, I put together the document. I titled it In Defense of Doubt. Um, I recognize that very few people will ever have the opportunity to visit with a church historian about their doubts. This was truly a privilege. And I felt like the entire situation spoke to a wider audience than the four people in just my living room. Um, and then- And the four people were the three of you and your wife? Correct, yep. Got it. Um, and then three days later, uh, Elder McKay gives this this talk, which got a lot of traction um, in lots of circles. I mean, it was it was, it was was received very well by, um, by active um, believing members, and it was received not as well um, by, you know, people who've got some faith crisis. So as I write here, um, that the entire situation spoke to more people, but the experience that I'm going to share here today, the conversation, my document, it's almost as if it serves as the source material for Elder McKay's talk three days later. And I'm not saying that I necessarily am the source material, but I might as well be. Um, he's referencing um, you know, compelling reasons to doubt. My entire document is presented to the church historian as my compelling reasons to doubt. And so, um, how long a, before he gave that talk, did this all happen? Did you guys say, or did you not? Three days, three days, Saturday, the 22nd is the meeting in Joe's living room. <clears> and <throat> Tuesday, the 25th is the talk at BYU, Idaho. But Man. he did, he did mention in his discussion with you, some of the things that he later, that he already had prepared and was planning on saying at BYU, Idaho, right? Like the Joseph F. Smith quote. Right. Yeah. Some of it was verbatim. Some of our conversation was verbatim. Um, all right, so uh, the last paragraph that I for an introduction and then everything else I can I can feed into whatever we're doing here. So the next question is why am I talking to you guys? Um, because the first person I ever openly spoke to about any doubt was Kyle McKay, and here I am a month and a half later um, diving into the deepest pool that I could possibly find, um, which is insane for me. Like right now, I'm just thinking, what were you thinking? Um, I apparently wasn't. So here is my purpose in coming on here today uh, and part of the document. So I wrote my primary purpose in creating the document and my hope in having this conversation is that active members, family and friends would consider that those of us that have come to different conclusions than them, um, we're not lazy, we're not lax, we're not foolish, we're not dishonest. Um, I hope that we can be treated with some respect. That's the, that's the talk, lazy learner. Um, I'm hoping that we can have um, relationships where even if we disagree, our positions are valid. Um, and you know, I'm, I, I know you guys are familiar with, and I'm, I absolutely uh, am a fan of Dan McClellan, and he has his um, data over dogma. And right. my concept, and I'm stealing this blatantly, is more of a daughters over dogma. I want, um, I want families that are struggling because this problem's not going away. Um, to be able to at least keep those relationships intact. Um, and, and, and in my personal situation, that's, that's been the case. Um, but I know that's not the case for other people. So I'm going to step out into the public and take a bullet if I have to, um, metaphorically, to create some more dialogue. Um, and so I continue on with this. And I just said that, you know, the second purpose that I have uh, is a little more controversial. And that would just be to inc encourage more disclosure on the part of the church. Um, I think there's a significant difference between the act of disclosure and the act of discovery. I talk about this uh, you know, in my actual paper, but right. it's the equivalent of an unfaithful spouse admitting to an affair only after having been caught. Um, that's, dis that's discovery. And that's kind of the, the situation that we find ourselves in in the church. 
Um, and I want the church to, to have a more, um, more open, more honest disclosures. Um, and then, you know, as, as you hear, you know, John and, and Mike talk about, we have more informed consent. We have more respect all the way around. So that's my basic introduction. There's some more stuff that I can feed in, but that's what brings us to this moment. Okay, great. Because here's the big surprise is that Joe or somebody. <laughs> and that leads me to my next thing. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Recorded the entire conversation, the hour and a half visit between Kyle McKay and Joe with father-in-law and wife in the same room is all recorded. Now, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to put that up at Radio Free Mormon by the weekend. But I also didn't want to just come on Mormonism Live and play the whole thing because sure. that would kind of defeat the purpose. Instead, I went through this hour and a half and I picked what ended up being 10 clips. And I'm surprised it got to the number 10. But I kept going through it and I kept finding more and more that I just thought was really remarkable. I thought you did a great job of presenting your case in a very gracious and kind and friendly way to the church historian. So about the first hour is where they allowed you to speak. And then pretty much the second half hour is where Kyle, the church historian, uh, sort of has a chance to respond. Sure. So if we can play the first clip, this is the first two minutes. This is sort of when they're coming into the room. Let and... me let me jump in before we play that yeah. clip. Yeah. Um, it's just so I, I can only imagine there are people in the audience or will someday be in the audience that find that super offensive that I recorded this this conversation. So let me say this. Um, the fact that I have a recording of it, it's not unique. Um, not for me. I record every conversation uh, that I think um, has any significance. And here is. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is my, my little file of, of recorded conversations. In my profession and in my personal life, <laughs> this goes on and on and on. Um, I have learned, and it is it has saved my bacon more than once, mm -hmm. um, being able to, to go, that's not what I said. Um, legally, that's not what happened in that situation, and I pulled that out. So um, I say the people that are closest to me are very aware of it. I have colleagues that will come looking for recordings. Um, hey, did you get that recorded? Did you record that? Um, and then I said this, if, if anything, the entire experience demonstrates Elder McKay is consistent in his position. Uh, his devotional uh, and his living room visit are, are very, very similar. Um, and if I didn't have this recording, then we're not having a conversation. Because right. if we don't have this recording, I'm just some random dude who's talking about his made up best friend, the church historian. Mm -hmm. No one's going to go, they're going to, whatever, that's not what he said. That's not what you said. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say, and then we'll, I, I'll go ahead and mute and turn myself off, um, is this. There may be some people who feel like me coming on this podcast was unfair to Kyle McKay, um, to Elder McKay. Um, I have nothing critical to say about Elder McKay. In fact, I, I think he's intelligent, funny, um, I, all the things that you said. I, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think he's the right guy for the job. Um, but if my position appears critical of him or more importantly of his position, um, I want the listeners to take a step back and kind of look at this big picture. Um, Kyle McKay stands as the head of the entire church history department. He serves as the interface between the church history and the first presidency. Um, with access to all the resources, the archives, the brightest minds and best historians available within the church. He's backed by an organization with, with, 18 million members and hundreds of billions of dollars um, with millions of those members willing to defend him at the drop of a hat. Uh, if we're going to make a comparison, Kyle McKay is a major league pitcher and I'm standing over here holding my wiffle ball bat. So I don't even think there's any way that, that elder McKay should feel threatened by, or that anybody should feel like they need to defend, um, you know, the, the major league player. And we're just having a conversation with a rookie. So hit it. You didn't say his position was consistent. You just said he was consistent in his position. Correct. He was okay. consistent in his position between the talk that we have that's already public and, and nationwide. Uh, and what you will hear coming up today, it's the same thing. I mean, he doesn't, there's at no point that you go, Ooh, he's different behind closed doors. Right. He's not, he, he yeah, is. He's, he's consistent. Yeah. yeah. He's consistent. And I think he comes across very well, but we'll certainly let our audience judge. Um, if we can play this for, are you done with your introductory um, yep. comments? Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll let's be play going this. to McDonald's. See ya. 
Okay, bye bye. This is the first two minute clips. The first two minute clip of everybody coming in. And this is just audio. Well, welcome. I'm, I'm genuinely happy to have you in my home. I'm yeah. thrilled to be here. Well, I know you, you've studied, you know, you've given me that book of the past church historian, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for you to meet him. Are you still hearing that, Bill? Because I'm not. Can, can you not hear it? I cannot hear it. I heard it at the beginning. Okay, hey, hold on a minute. Away. Okay, so let me try something else. I, I had to, it was playing on my speaker. So let me try really quick to do this again. Present, share screen. I had to switch it because I was just getting it blaring in my office here. So I'm going to start it over. By the way, Joe, the person whose letters are in blue, that voice, that's your father-in-law, right? Right, that's the state president. Yeah. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Well, welcome. I'm, I'm genuinely happy to have you in my home. I'm yeah. thrilled to be here. Well, I know you, you've studied, you know, you've given me that book of the past church historian, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for you to meet him. Yeah. Ask him any questions. You know, I know there's things in the church history that's bothering you that you don't quite agree with. This is the man to talk. Right. And I believe that. Thank you. We probably have the same things. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So let me, um, let me say this. Um, I guess we we'll jump right into some stuff. Um, one, from a just from a you know a big picture, me in my mind, I, I absolutely um, am here to, to to learn, and I'm not um, I'm not dumb enough or smart enough to think that that I know everything. I don't know what I don't know. Um, I, you know, I deal with um, teenagers and parents. And faculty on a pretty regular basis that are always there's comp I'm an assistant yeah, principal assistant yeah, principal. So I was gonna say high school in education. Um so I get to be in a room working with different stories and different problems yeah. and concerns and, and ninety percent of the problem is someone in the room is missing information. Um and you don't and you know, the people who are super passionate about something, they don't know what they don't know. And so uh, I am obviously I'm going to share what I know and what I feel in my position and my view of things, but I'm I'm absolutely willing to have that opinion, position, and view adjusted whenever evidence helps me along. So if that makes sense, can I give an opening statement as well? <laughs> Please do. It, it, it may be, and I hope you're not disappointed that I don't directly answer, uh, at least not to your satisfaction. But I am here to build faith, and, and I want to distinguish between building faith in Jesus Christ and trying to recruit you back to full activity in the church. Um, in, in my mind, I mean, if you believe in Jesus, you believe in church because of what he said about church. But I, I, want, I want to help you build your faith in Christ. So, and, and if I have information that can be helpful, I'm happy to share. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so there's the first clip. There's the first clip. And I've got to tell you, uh, everything sounds very nice, very gracious. Kyle sounds super cool, just like he used to be on the mission. And I, I just think he's a great guy. Um, I have to comment, though, that what I hear is the state president bringing in the hired gun, the church historian, to answer the questions about church history and then I can only imagine what he's thinking when one of the first things out of the church historian's mouth is, I hope you won't be surprised if I don't directly answer your questions. It's like, isn't that the whole point of being there? So I don't know if you want to comment on that, Joe. If you do, that's fine. I won't expect you to, okay? Because, you know, I share the same, same. Well, I mean, I think everyone would have expected that. Um, but I can see why uh, the church historian... Uh, specifically the way our church historian, and we'll get into it later, um, is structured, I can see why he's not willing and wanting to jump into that um, that kind of a give and take with answers about church history. I think he's well-versed enough to know he doesn't have any good ones. Good answers, that is. Yeah. yeah, he's no idiot. He didn't get put in there. Well, he knows about history. I know he thinks that the people under him are much better and they're certainly trained historians and they probably do know more total stuff, but he knows his ABCs on church history. He was no slouch even back on the mission. So anyway, we're going to start playing a few clips. That's the first clip. And 
the thing that I love about these clips, even though we can't play all of them, and by that I mean the entire thing, we'll try and play all the clips, is just the entire scenario that this is happening while you're talking face to face with the church historian and you are just laying out all of these issues with church history and he's just sitting there and taking it. I know what he's doing is he's waiting for you to be done so he can make his pitch about building your faith in Jesus and avoiding answering all those questions, which is why he starts off with, I hope you won't be disappointed if I don't answer because I have no intention of answering them. I've got my work around that I'm going to try and come in and save the day at the end. But, Bill, do you have anything that you wanted to add before we go on with this next clip? Uh, no, because my thoughts really are going to come in as McKay contextualizes these with other things he says. I mean, I, I've got stuff I could say, but it's going to be accentuated by what comes after here. Okay, so let's go to the second clip. So in order to, one, um, collect my thoughts, make something intelligent sounding and, and then allow myself to keep things, you know, on task. Um, I started writing stuff down this week. By the time I stopped writing, I had a significant book. And I was like, what is that? I mean, I'm reading through it. I'm like, I just wrote, wrote, wrote. So then I deleted it and deleted and deleted it. And anyway, so I created a document. You don't have to look at the document. You don't have to go near the document, but I just figured, I wrote it, I put it together this week. It would give us a reference that we can talk about. Um, I can leave it with you, both of you. Um, I made copies for everyone. And if there's anything in there, you know, we're not gonna make it through every word. Um, and I don't know that you'll ever make it through every word. Um, but if you do, and you see something, or you come up with an idea in a week or two weeks, email and go, hey, you know, I was thinking about Joe. And I'd love that feedback. I'd love to have this be something that we create a dialogue off of. If that's okay. So first thing is that those beeps, that was where your, your father-in-law's name was, was mentioned, swearing. right? And you were saying to Kyle McKay, you were saying to the church historian, if something comes up, you can email him and he'll forward it to me, right? Mm -hmm. Or okay. I was swearing. No, yeah, there was no swearing going on. In and any here, of this. here is what the document looked like. Cover up okay, that. It great. was found too much too much and the, that's after all the deletions mm -hmm. so it's just amazing to me that uh you know church history so well that you're just sitting down and you're just typing because you know it all i mean you're just typing down the stuff that you already know and it becomes this voluminous document well that and you the, have to start deleting from yeah sure and the, and the point of the document i mean there's i'm not trying to recreate anything i'm not trying to to duplicate i'm i I just wanted to present um, a, a paradigm for doubt. I mean, literally, I'm not, you, we all know, we've seen it. Um, you can go after a single thing and, and dive as deep as you want on, you know, whatever that problem is with church history. This was meant to be surface level paradigm, right. big thought, big picture. Right. And I, as I understand it, the idea was to give a defense of doubt as being a rational position. Yes. And I'll just note, there are thousands of problems that are absolutely valid in terms of showing that the church has a weaker position on an issue than the critic. But every one of us thinks differently. And I think it's important, Joe, that like you did, every person picked the issues that you could you could talk about and feel confident about. And that may not be the same issues for everybody. So I think, you know, Jeremy created the CES letter. And I created the Mormon primer and I did it because those were the issues that I thought I could wrap my head around as being things I could defend as indefensible, essentially. Mm. Yeah. So are we ready to go into clip number three? Let's do it. Some historians, and I'm, I'm a big, uh, as I said at the beginning, I love history. It is my thing. Um, uh, Leonard Arrington was the book, the Gregory Prince biography, loved the book, um, and I am so stinking honored that you're in my house, genuinely. This is, what did I say when I woke up this morning? You're gonna, he oh. said, it feels like Christmas morning. <laughs> I said, it feels like Christmas morning. Um, to be able to meet and talk, I haven't talked with anyone, anyway. So, some historians have genuinely tried to be more open and honest. Church President Heber J. Grant required B.H. Roberts to censor some documents when compiling the history of the church. 
Elder Roberts responded, quote, I desire, however, to take occasion disclaiming any responsibility for the mutilating of that very important part of President Young's manuscript. And also to say that while you had the physical powers of eliminating that passage from history, I do not believe you had any moral right to do so. Stephen Snow, who I'm sure you uh, are very familiar with, um, LDS Church historian said, I think in the past there was a tendency to keep a lot of the records closed or at least not give access to the information. But the world has changed in the last generation with access to information on the internet. We can't continue with that pattern. I think we need to continue to be more open. And then Richard Bushman's infamous um, statement. In 2016, Richard Bushman was recorded saying, quote, I think for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. The dominant narrative is not true. It can't be sustained. The church has to absorb all this new information or it'll be on very shaky grounds. And that's what it's trying to do. And that'll be a strain for a lot of people, older people especially. Now, to clarify that quote, he went on the record, because that one was recorded without him knowing. He went on the record and said, this is what I meant. We must be willing to modify the account according to the newly authenticated facts. If we don't, we will weaken our position. The whole church, from the top to the bottom, has to adjust to the findings of our historians. It would appear, however, that current church leadership disagrees. In 2017, one year after Richard Bushman's statement, by the way, we're only one page away, we're, we're going to make it. Um, after Richard Bushman's statement, M. Russell Ballard and Dallin H. Oaks said the following, quote, some are saying that the church has been hiding the fact that there's more than one version of the first vision, which is just not true. The facts are we don't study. It. We don't go back and search what has been said on the subject. But it's this idea that the church is hiding something, which we would have to say there has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything from anybody. So just trust us wherever you are in the world. And you share this message with anyone else who raises the question about the church not being transparent. We're as transparent as we know how to be in telling the truth. Speaking to married couples just two years later, Elder Oaks had this to add. Matters of church history and doctrinal issues have led some spouses to inactivity. Some spouses wonder how to best go about researching and responding to such issues. Quote, I suggest that research is not the answer. Close quote. The implication of those two statements are profound. In short, Church leaders have never hidden in any way anything ever from anybody. And if a member has concerns or doubts about history, it's because we don't study. We don't go back and search what's been said on the subject. But then immediately contradicting themselves with trust us, research is not the answer. What better evidence can you get from someone that their position is weak or that they're hiding something than having them ask you not to research it? There is a significant difference between the act of disclosure and the act of discovery. It's the equivalent of an unfaithful spouse admitting to an affair, only after having been caught in one. In recent years, when the church has appeared to be transparent, it's been reactionary. The church has been forced to the table. In each instance, the problems or the problem was discovered by the public, not disclosed by church leaders. The church itself teaches, quote, we can also intentionally deceive others by silence or by telling only part of the truth. Whenever we lead people in any way to believe something that's not true, we're not being honest. As the church historian, I'm aware that none of this is new to you. If any of the above information that I presented is factually incorrect, um, please let me know and I will correct it. I have no expectation that this information would change a belief or testimony of Joseph Smith, nor do I have any desire to. As stated before, my desire is that you would consider that those of us that have come to a different conclusion than you are not lazy learners, lax disciples, foolish or dishonest as implied by those in the highest positions of church leadership, and then repeated by members throughout the church. I would hope, instead, that we could be treated with respect and our position recognized as valid. Okay. Well, I will tell you that's very impressive. I, I loved your, uh, your use of Elder Ballard saying that we've never hidden anything from anybody. And the problem is you members, you just don't study. And then having Elder Oak say, um, don't study. <laughs> Research is not the answer. That was brilliant, I thought. What do you think, Bill? Elder McKay, I have to suppose you're watching this. And I just want to note, first off, your missionary companion, Radio Free Mormon up there in the corner, did an episode called 
Elder Ballard blows up the church. And it's this idea that the church has lied and been dishonest and deceptive on numerous occasions. And often in life, there comes these uh, juxtaposition or these paradoxes where you have to pick one or the other. And the two things you have to pick between is loyalty and integrity. Integrity requires that we deal with the facts that church leaders have always labeled those who have left as less than broken, lazy, chafe, tears, lazy learners, lax disciples. And the reality is, is that our church leaders have hid things over and over and over again to the point where I've put lists together, RFM's done episodes, we've covered so many things you guys have done that have been hidden. You have a chance, my friend, to have influence in the church history department and to be a voice to the top to say, stop bullshitting. Stop telling people that the folks who lose their faith are the bad guys and stop telling people that you're not hiding anything because the list of the things you've hidden is hundreds long. The times you've obfuscated, you've shaded the truth, you've whitewashed, you've carefully denied things, that uh, carefully worded denials, it gets old. And the point is nobody trusts you guys anymore. So if you want to rebuild the church with integrity, you're going to have to start being honest. And you get the chance, my friend, to be a voice up and go, knock it off. And then you get to pick whether you're going to have integrity or whether you're going to have loyalty. And we get to see. Yes, unfortunately, I think it'll come down to he gets to pick whether he has integrity or whether he has a job. Yeah, but there's a nice way to say the right things. Marlon Jensen sort of did it. Yeah. And I think the time has come because right now in the church manuals RFM, it's still saying that the church today is the exact church that Christ restored. And then you've got the book out of the Maxwell Institute that says that's not true. So just as Bushman said, you need to change your narrative. The church is doing it right now but you're speaking out both sides of your mouth and you're bad mouthing those who lose faith when they're the folks who are telling the truth. Did you want to say anything about this before we go to the next clip, Joe? No, I agree exactly with what Bill said. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that we're at a crossroads, um, you know, in, uh, in your meeting, I think it was your meeting with Dan McClellan. You guys talked about uh, whether or not um, he felt like, you know, there was pushback from some of the intellectuals in the church at this point, people who were presenting stuff that could be contradict or um, contrary to whatever positions. And he said that he was ready to make that move forward. And, and those that he worked with and those he was associating with, they were all ready to move forward, whether or not it was accepted as, you know, as well as he would like. But I think there is a kind of a critical mass uh, at this point that is kind of moving the ball in the right direction. And I, and I have, I have optimism. Can I just say one more thing really quick, RFM? Hmm. Elder McKay, if you have any doubt about whether Elder Oaks or Elder Ballard were being honest about whether the church has hidden anything, simply go to mormondiscussionpodcast.org, top right-hand corner of the header. You just click this help, helpful resources, and then click this one right here, examining the deception and obfuscation within Mormonism. And I've listed with source material 73 instances where church leaders have uh, been deceitful, deceptive, dishonest, or flat out hid history. And then you can read that. And again, just like Joe, if I've gotten something wrong, uh, I would welcome a correction, but there's no doubt that the church leaders are lying about lying. Yes. Um, and I we've documented that all along the way. We have got the receipts and we've got a lot of them on that issue. So, the next clip is actually going to be Joe's conclusion. So we're about an hour into this. As I said, we're just taking clips. And then we have a number of clips of Kyle talking and talking with Joe. So if we can go to this last one, this conclusion, I thought this was especially powerful. And by the way, Joe, when it's done, I'm going to be asking you the question, what is Kyle McKay doing? How is he acting? How is he responding as you're saying this to him? Because I'm imagining you're looking at him as you're addressing him. Okay. In conclusion, as I previously stated in my introduction, there is a reasonable explanation that can account for the creation of the Book of Mormon and LDS theology, other than the current LDS narrative. That is, Joseph Smith engaged in what LDS historian Carol Gibbons calls bricolage. 
It is the art of repurposing objects into a new interpretation. Gibbon goes on to say, the term that I would use is inspired eclecticus. That's a problem for a lot of Latter-day Saints who have read a very different version of history where Mormonism erupted in an absolute vacuum, close quote. I believe that Joseph was interacting with the world around him. He was taking the object, stories, religious discussions of his day, and, sorry, religious discussions of his day, even his own sexual desires, and I'm not saying that negatively, I'm saying that's how he's trying to understand them, um, and repurposing them within a single religious framework, creating as he went and changing whenever he needed I've studied the apologetic response to each of the things that I presented, and I find them unconvincing. Philosopher William James once wrote, when a thing is new, people say that's not true. Later, when a truth is obvious, they say it's not important. Finally, when its importance cannot be denied, they say, anyway, it's not true. I am genuinely grateful that you would sacrifice your time to visit with me about church history. If you made it this far, you're probably regretting that decision. (laughs) But I hope not. You once said, I'm called the church historian, but in truth, the real historians are the people that I work with. I preside over a department that is full of absolutely brilliant people. I believe Elders Jensen, Snow, and yourself are men of integrity. I also believe that the calling of church historian must be the single most difficult calling in the church. You yourself admit that you're not a trained historian, you're a trained lawyer. You've spent your career representing large corporations, now you've been called to represent the LDS Church, where you oversee the church history department and the real historians on your client's behalf. I have no problem with that. You have been given the daunting task of bridging the gap between the two. As you speak to members, advise local leaders, listen to historians, and sit in presiding councils, please remember this. In the end, I did not have a faith crisis. I have trust crisis. I have been taught that faith is the belief in things unseen, but to disbelieve what you can in fact see is not faith, it's fantasy. My experience over the last 10 years with thousands of hours spent researching and studying both sides of these issues has been physically exhausting and emotionally difficult. Some would say that I never had a testimony in the first place. I know that's impossible to measure a testimony, but here's what I can quantify. I served an honorable full-time mission. I've read the Book of Mormon countless of times. I attended the temple faithfully. I was an EFY counselor. I was married in the temple with Elder Neil A. Maxwell officiating. I was a full-time seminary teacher for 14 years. I served as a counselor in two bishoprics. I pulled a handcart through Martin's Cove. I sat in the office of and discussed church history with Lachlan Mackay, an apostle of the community of Christ, church historian and direct descendant, Joseph Smith. I participated in an archaeological dig the original Smith family homestead in Nauvoo. I stood atop Zelf's Mound. I've spent weeks on end, year after year in Nauvoo, studying, listening, and exploring church history. I've stood in Carthage at the place of Joseph Smith's death in reverence at least a dozen times. I've anointed the sick and laid hands upon my people with President Thomas S. Monson. My entire worldview has been disrupted, and almost every single personal relationship that I have has been affected. Please believe me when I tell you that I've only arrived at this conclusion after a lengthy, careful, and heartfelt investigation. So sorry. Any good jokes? I thought it was beautiful of you to say, I know you work for them. I know they're your client. I know that's where your bias is going to be. I know that you're going to lean that way. But damn it, start listening to the historians. And by the way, folks, having had those conversations with those historians, they they really are the good guys. They're all trying behind the scenes to get the church to be more honest without crossing lines so they get themselves fired. And it's a handful of them at least that I can I could name. Um, telling him to listen to them and then to go back to the brethren and say like, you, I know I work for you, but you just can't do it this old way. Like in all honesty, the entire curriculum needs rewritten. It's an entirely new story now. 
Yeah, I was I was moved by that as well. And I understand from talking with you, Joe, that you were not planning and you were even surprised by the emotion that came into your voice. Yeah, I uh, by default, um, I just uh, I don't cry, at least not very often. My wife has always seen it as a character flaw. Um, I can probably count on one hand the times I've cried um, in 25 years. Uh, so I didn't see that coming. Um, and and I'll be honest with you, I have very mixed emotions of it. Um, it's it's 100 percent me being 100 um, percent whatever that moment was. Uh, there was no performance, but I would have preferred that I didn't. I, I really would have. Um, not because I don't think emotion, um, that emotion shouldn't be shared and we shouldn't be authentic, but I think it, it creates a, a whole different dynamic. And I don't want to, I don't want anyone to ever feel like if you're having a conversation and someone's being, you know, either really sad on one end, uh, you know, emotional or the, the, the vice versa would be uh, applicable, you know, someone upset about the things I'm sharing. So for me crying, you can see why, uh, you know, a, a believing member of the church, after hearing everything I just said, would have had an entirely different emotional reaction. And I wouldn't want them to have that reaction. I would want to try to keep it as focused on the facts as possible. And so um, I have mixed emotions. You know, I don't, I don't want to play into someone's sympathy because I'm, I was emotional and have them go, oh, you know, now we can't say what we wanted to say because the guy's going to start crying on me. <laughs> right. Well, those same people who might interpret your expression of emotion in a negative way would probably be 100% behind that emotion if you were bearing testimony of the truth of the church. Sure. So I just wanted to underscore something that happened in there because it's going to come up later, which is where you're talking about to the fact that Elder McKay is an attorney. And you mentioned that you know that he has a client to represent and the client is the church. That Elder McKay is an attorney who has a client to represent and that client is the church. Okay, I think I underscored it enough and people will be able to remember it when we pick up on it later. So the next clips now, we get into Elder McKay and what he has to say. Do we have the next one of that? In a world in which reasons to doubt, and I'll use this phrase, swirl and hiss about you, how do you doubt not? In a world where there are reasons to be fearful, how do you fear not? And I think the answer, at least in part, is what Joseph, Joseph F. Smith said, you, you build upon a foundation that is so sure and certain that the rest of it may exist but it doesn't shake you. So then the question is, what is that foundation? And it ha has to be Jesus Christ. It just has to be Jesus Christ. So it leads me to a, to a question of you. What is your foundation? What, what, this, is, this is doubt. Give me truth. Give me faith. So um, what do you have faith in? And I still what is sure and certain in your life? Sure. Family, for sure, yeah. 100%, um, 100%. Um, and I, you can jump in on any of this, I know it's directed to me, but it would include both of us. Um, I still feel like I have a good relationship with Christ. Um, my, I, I, I genuinely feel like I can't trust the information that I got from church leadership, and which is difficult with my relationship with Christ, because I understand the language that I use, the, the lenses that I look through, the metaphors that I understand all came through the lens of, of LDS theology. And so the Christ that I see is in a lot of ways an LDS Christ. But I spent, I mean, I've said I still do, I spend a lot of time um, trying to understand um, Christ through just a biblical, and, and the Bible's got as many problems historically as you, anything that I you do could, present. You could write this same thing about any right. religion. Of, of course. Yeah. Maybe thicker. I'm, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm sure of it. And, and so, um, and that's why I said, that, like, my faith, my faith, it's, it's trust. It's, I can see someone lying to me. I mean, I deal with it every day at work. And as soon as someone lies to me, at that moment, I no longer can, can trust that 
personally. I mean, I'm going to now go and I'm going to pull every piece of evidence and data and I can, and then I'm going to lean on the data as hard as I can because that person's lost credibility. And I understand in my own life when I have lost credibility with other people, there's not a word I can say with that relationship that will ever restore. And so, burnt bridge. And I give you this is still the same. Um, and so, back to this concept of, of what I do and how I do um, with this, and this is going to sound, this is either damning on my part, and, and it is what it is, but to be completely authentic with both of you to understand where I come from, um, I had a personal experience that caused me to not just doubt, I knew because I had, I had quantifiable data, I knew that I was not listening to the Spirit. I knew that I could not take my understanding of what the Holy Ghost felt like, my personal experience. You know, we all have powerful spiritual experiences. Um, I have had in my life a handful of powerful, life-changing spiritual experiences, which is where my testimony came from. I was aware of 90% of this as a seminary teacher. Um, like I said, I've sat with Lachlan Mackay, um, who's a amazing human being and and talked where he was I mean he was being faithful as he could but just presenting you know different ways to look at church history and it didn't even it was it was just water off a duck's back uh, it was just a great conversation between two whatever I'm not a historian he is um but when I realized when I realized that I cannot trust the leadership of the church and I'm not saying that about you two and that's not it at all. But as a, as a historical memory, I can show you that they're not honest. Um, that puts a major, you know, chasm in my ability to then access anything that comes from their source. Right. Well, I'll tell you, uh, it's very, very interesting listening to this exchange between you and the church historian. And I honestly don't know. I will say, I really like Kyle McKay. I think he's a decent guy. I think he's better than decent. I think he's a great guy. The problem is, is that he is trying to argue an untenable position. And it seems to be all the rage nowadays for general authorities or apologists to come up with some kind of system to be able to prove the church is true without ever once addressing any of the problematic issues that people have with it. The goal is to just circumvent all of those in some way so we don't do, have to address them. I'm sorry. What do they call that? What do they call those? I think they're called wood tools. When you tell somebody an answer that works in any system, you could have been a Jehovah's Witness, Joe, and it could have been a church historian within the Jehovah's Witness faith sitting down with you and going, yeah, I mean, these, these things are real. Let's just build a testimony on Christ. Let's just have faith. Elder McKay, you don't have answers, and the answer that you do give works within any system, which means Mormonism is no more true based on the solution you're giving. It, there's no way to go about finding out that the church actually isn't true. In other words, your advice works everywhere. I would like to know if Mormonism is true or not, and if the evidence is against it, then we have to have a way to figure that out. What is that way? especially if there are compelling reasons to doubt what you said in the BYU-Idaho address. Yeah. Quote, unquote. You know, this it's this idea, and this is why I call it an untenable position, because the argument appears to be that you build your faith on Christ. That's the only thing that's important. And if you build yourself, your, yourself on Christ, your faith on Christ, and he's the savior of the world and the son of God, then somehow that means that ineluctably you will end up being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. And that's the huge chasm, to use your word. I'll say it's an abyss of logical connections. There's no connection there. And it's so far apart that evil Knievel couldn't jump this. Mm -hmm. But it's as if it doesn't exist. It's not going to be addressed by the church historian or anybody else who's doing it with uh, Elder Corbridge or... Elder Bednar is getting into the act. We're more recently, Jacob Hansen, you know, everybody's trying to come up with some way to prove the church is true without dealing with the evidence. Uh, RFM, Joe, in his conclusion, the previous clip, he, he said some quote where it was, uh, 
when you don't think it's the truth, you, you say it's a lie. And once you know it's the truth, you say it's not important. I th- and then you oh, finally yeah. you confront it, right? We're Very in that nice. middle stage that the truth isn't important. There's the, as you pointed out, Corbridge, there's the primary questions and there's the secondary questions. And Elder McKay, you keep de- redirecting to the primary questions mm-hmm. because you sure as hell don't want to deal with the secondary ones because the evidence is overwhelming. I was telling you RFM on the phone today. I told you also I wouldn't talk much tonight and I can't help it. I told you on the phone tonight that they play this game and we were taught this in the church. You know, faith requires that there's evidence on both sides. It's sort of even. And because it's sort of even, you now have the space to to act out in faith. And I'm simply telling you, Elder McKay, and I think you sort of sense it and know it. The scale is so lopsided that you and everyone else in the leadership of the church don't want to touch these secondary questions with a 10-foot pole. And that's the reason that these models are created, so they don't have to. But they don't convince anybody who doesn't already agree with you in the first place. Yeah. So, are we ready for number six? How do you pronounce that? Tu quo que. And the reason I wrote this, I'm sorry, I put these on there and Maven did a great job. She labeled them how I labeled them. This is one of the things that happens here is where Kyle does a tu quo que argument. And tu quo que just means you too. Or in other words, if you're accusing me of doing something that's wrong, then my response is, well, you did something that was wrong too. That's a logical fallacy. This is the name of a logical fallacy because it doesn't make any difference whether somebody else does it. It hasn't addressed the issue of whether you've done it. You're just trying to distract and draw some kind of equivalency, but it doesn't really answer the accusation (laughs) against you. You're just saying, well, you're another one. And a variation of that is instead of talking directly with somebody and say, you did that too, you can talk about somebody else like maybe Joseph Smith or a church leader, right? and say, well, prophets in the Old Testament did bad things too. It's a two quo que argument. It's a logical fallacy. It does not address the issue that's been raised about Joseph Smith to say that Moses did something wrong. I'm I'm beginning to get the feel that if we were in a courtroom and the church was on trial and it was lawyer McKay on one side and lawyer Radio Freeman on the other, I'm beginning to get the feeling of which side would win. Well, his problem is he's got no witnesses to call. He's got no exhibits to introduce. He's got no evidence for his case. So, yeah, I mean, you could have my dog representing the side and he'd win the argument. And he's not even an especially smart dog. Rut row, Raggy. <laughs> Here's where you're getting at. God had a really good thing going and then he put people in it. And, and people have messed it up ever since. I mean, if you're gonna, if if this is gonna stop you from believing, then you should you should stop believing prior to 1820. You should stop believing when Moses looked around so and to make sure nobody's looking, then killed a man and, and hid the bush. Or you should you should go before that and wonder why, you know, to think about drunk naked Noah, or Peter the ear cutter author, and. and there's all sorts of, I mean, this, when he put people in the mix, it got messy and it's, and it has stayed messy ever since. So that's why, that's why I say, make your foundation Christ and study him the best way you know how the new Testament is wonderful. To me, it, it leads me to a church. There's gotta be a church because Jesus said to Peter, look, I'm going to build a church. It's going to be built on the rock of revelation. It's going to have the keys of the kingdom of heaven by which you bind and loose on earth and in heaven. Um, baptism was a, was something Jesus also showed us, faith, repentance. Um, where, so those things help me understand, and those have got to be part of Jesus and what he taught. Um, although you might have lost trust, to me, the Book of Mormon Instead of jumping, and this is is my message, instead of jumping to the collateral conclusion that if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph was a prophet, and this is God's church, just read it for its primary purpose. Go have an experience with Jesus in that book. But in any event, seek Christ and make him your sure foundation. And this also comes out of the Book of Mormon. You taught it. 
Telemann 512, that's got to be your foundation. Because if he's your foundation and you build upon that foundation, you cannot fall. You cannot. I mean, it's not just you will not fall. I mean, it, it's you don't fall. So go build upon Christ and then and then just understand that you, even in, in your best efforts, have become someone else's reason to doubt. And so have I. And so has Moses, Noah, Joseph, Peter, and everyone else who's ever lived has given somebody a reason to doubt. More wood tools. Okay, so that's the two quote quay fallacy, which I already talked about. By the way, in the middle of that, I, I ducked out of here to grab my, tri not my triple com, my quad, which I got, I think, in 1984. So this is post mission, but I'm totally into, totally into the apologetics. And I want to show you that I had done my homework with the help of other publications, I'm sure. This isn't all original to me, but I'm going to hold this up here and see if you can see this. Okay. Now I can't see if you can see it. Can you see all that? So over yep. here it says, could a prophet? And then I've got a entire list of things together with scriptural references for all sorts of immoral, bad, or questionable things that a prophet did. So I have this ready to go whenever anybody brings up something immoral, questionable, or, or unethical that one of the LDS church leaders has done. Well, look here. You know, they did bad things back then too, and therefore, it's okay. Yeah, that's the problem, is that last part. It's okay. No, it's not okay. It's a logical fallacy. And I've got all of, how many? I have 31. I've got, did you know, I've got a whole bunch of, I've got 12 others. Did you know God kills in anger? Second Samuel 6, 6 through 7, that God hardens a person's heart. Just all these things, all these two quo quo fallacies, which only work, by the way, if you're dealing with somebody who has a belief in the Bible. So, which is also full of that. problems and easy to de deconstruct on its own. Yes. And that's and, the problem. And once again, he goes back to just build your faith on Jesus Christ as if that means, and he says, you can't fall. Once you build your, your foundation, on, if Jesus is your foundation and you build on him, you cannot fall. But of course, what he's saying is, what he means is you can't leave the Mormon church. Yeah. And when he actually says what it is he means, you can see how it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. He, because he says there's by lots the, of people ahead. out there Sorry. who are not Mormons, who have built their foundation on Jesus Christ and have never been a member of the church. He says the primary purpose of the Book of Mormon, which is to bring people unto Christ, right? But that's not what the Book of Mormon says. It says its primary purpose is to go to the Lamanites and deliver the gospel to them. And we don't even know who the Lamanites are because that's another one of the problems that we have. Um, he doesn't want you to decide the Book of Mormon on its truthfulness because he knows that's a losing argument. So he points you to the fluffiness of the Book of Mormon. But hell, I can find fluffiness in lots of books. It doesn't make them true in having come from God. Yes, Lamanites are now officially the... 11th lost tribe i just like to jump in um i don't know if you can hear me am i yes, please so um the the concept here is of of you know having a problem with a prophet who does something that we view as sinful or as as behavior unbecoming of a prophet um that's never been my problem and that was never um recommended or even associated with the document that i produced clearly there are things in there that someone would hear and think oh polygamy He's got a problem with Joseph Smith's behavior. I don't. I have a problem with the fact that the narrative, the historical narrative is completely fabricated compared to, or the historical narrative is completely different compared to the taught narrative. Um, when it comes to the first vision, we often hear people say, oh, you have a problem that there's multiple first visions. I don't have a problem with multiple first visions. I have a problem that the contemporary historical evidence suggests there never was a first vision. Um, that's the document. And then we've hidden that historical evidence. So I don't have a problem with swearing and fighting and extramarital affairs. If that's what happened, I, that none of those would disqualify Joseph from being a prophet, not having the first vision. That's a problem. Mm. Good point. And as you bring up, um, it's just, um, somewhat galling, I suppose, when you know what's going on and you know, what's gone on. To have Elder Ballard say that the church has never hidden anything from anybody and use as his exhibit A, the 1832 account of the first vision, 
and pull out an old New Improvement era article from 1970 in which it's discussed for the first time. And he knows perfectly well that it was hidden by Joseph Fielding Smith for about three decades when it was cut out of letter book one and stowed safely away in Joseph Fielding Smith's safe, who was not only an apostle, but also the church historian. And he would not allow anybody to look at it unless they were either higher than he was or had authority from someone higher than Joseph Fielding Smith. We know all of these things. And then to have Elder Ballard say that it's our fault not only does he say we've never hidden anything from anybody, but it's our fault because we haven't studied. Oaks and Ballard used that 1970 uh, article mm -hmm. to demonstrate that it had been there all the time. RFM, would you, I'm just curious, would you direct me to where on the church website I could read that 1970? Yes, it's in the section on the church website called Mormon Think. Yeah, because you can't find it on the church website because the art, the Enzyme article he's talking about, New Era or whatever it was, the, the article he's talking about is hidden. You can't find it. Right. And he uses that as his evidence that things aren't hidden. It's been there all along, but the one he uses isn't there at all. It is kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> and prior to the advent of the Internet, um, this stuff was completely inaccessible. Our only access to church history as a faithful member of the church, is the curriculum that's sitting in front of us. The, the lay member of the church has no workaround. All they have is the church manual, and, and it's not there. I mean, and it's obviously not in the artwork. It's not anywhere else. It, it's just not there. Can I say that I really wanted to trust the leaders of the church? I did mm. trust the leaders of the church. I trusted mm. them implicitly. And they told me I could trust them. I did trust them. I trusted them that I could follow them in the ways of truth and righteousness and go back to heaven to live with uh, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in the celestial kingdom, all those things. And it was, I mean, I got to the point where I was making excuses for church leaders past and present that I would never have made for anybody else in order to keep my faith in them intact. But finally, I got to the point it was just the evidence was overwhelming. I couldn't deny it anymore. These people were not shooting straight. They were not trustworthy. And it was one of the greatest disappointments in my life when I found out that these people who I took to be and held to be and sustained as prophets, seers and revelators and apostles of Jesus Christ could not be trusted. What's the saying? Fool me once, right? Shame on you. And it's supposed to be fool me twice. Shame on me. But uh, it's fooled me a thousand fool times. Yeah, I mean, I Shame we all me. gave the benefit of the doubt so many times, and even just recently with the SEC report, these top leaders have no intention of changing. This well, is the mo. This is what they do. And let me jump in and, and give all of our, you know, each one of us that was in that position in the past a little bit of uh, breathing room, you know. And I'll talk about this later. It might come up in one of the clips, but. Where that crisis of trust is is placed, um, uh, or or who the blame, um, I, I don't know because you know you can't you can't beat up on a state president. You can't beat up on most general authorities. Twenty years ago, they didn't know either. They had no access to it. As a as an employee of the of the church and a seminary teacher, um, I mean, I was teaching stuff that there was. I had no other way to teach anything but that because that was all I knew. That was the only resource available to me, and so. I don't know who, you know, who we can accurately lay that at the feet of, um, but the average member of the church, the average lay member, uh, church leadership, stake president, and and prior to the internet, most general authorities would not have had access. Um, Joe, I know Lachlan McKay. He's a friend of mine. Uh, I, I've, I've sat with him in several occasions. Um, he hasn't seen Jesus either, right? He's an apostle of the community of Christ. He's, you could add up Jesus. the no, but you could add up the integrity of all fifteen men, and they would it wouldn't even amount to a, a nickel's worth of what Lachlan Mackay has. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, the, the integrity. You can see integrity a mile away, and these fifteen don't have it. Well, and I I, I don't want to necessarily jump on those fifteen. You feel free to. Um, but with regards to Lachlan Mackay, um, John Hamer, um, and and other members of the community of Christ. Uh, I have I've said this to my wife over the the last little while. I have no desire um, to change faith traditions. Um, yeah, I don't even know where I'm at in my own faith tradition, but I have utmost respect. 
for the leadership of the community of Christ, the members that I've associated with the community of Christ, um, the, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, could look to the community of Christ in a lot of ways, um, to pattern honesty, integrity, and open conversations. And Kyle and Lachlan are cousins, right? Some sort of distant relative. Mm hmm Okay, so let, are we ready to go to the next clip? Sorry, I'm slurring my words. Are we ready to go to the next clip? Too much ever clear before the show. Here Mark it Bob. goes. Polygamy, okay. So let me ask you this question. Off the top of your head, because we went through that. Um, where was I? I mean, was I wrong on any so, major so, point? So I would, I would, I would turn to my my colleagues in the church history department, the 1826 trial, for example. Right. I'm not as familiar with that, but I know it's not quite as clear as you're making it here. It's in the Joe Smith papers. It's one of the printed. Right. You can go through and read. Right. Found guilty. <laughs> paid ten dollars. Okay. So, so the and then then the the polygamy thing and his. Uh, Brian Hales, who's a pretty good. Sure, uh, Brian, Brian. Yeah, Hales. so I, he's, I think he's reliable. He would put Fanny Alger in a different place in history, but but would say, yeah, they were married or they had a relationship. Um, I, the whole, the whole polygamy thing or plural marriage. Um, here's how it's been described to me: it, it was messy going in, and it was messy going out. It was messy getting out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you study that. We had we had apostles. Yeah, she's not John Taylor Jr. Sure. Yeah. So it was messy going in, messy going out for a period of time. I would probably figure it out how to do it. In it, I mean, if it worked. But it was messy going in. It was messy going out. If it was for the purpose stated in Jacob two, then Joseph wasn't very good at it at all. Sure. Because there is absolutely no evidence that he had a child by anyone but Emma. Right. So, so he wasn't infertile. Emma wasn't infertile. I doubt all the other women were infertile, but he, but I, I don't know how much sexual activity there was. But even the church says that there yeah. likely was yeah. sexual activity. Yeah. That was not necessarily the primary motive. The illegality of the marriages, I'm not sure about because I've been, I, I attended a wedding. I attended a wedding where the, the girl was underage, but with parental consent, it became legal. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Helen Mark, Kimball, for example, Heber C is the one who came right. up with that idea. Hey, and they were sealed. And was there a relationship physically? We just we right. just don't know. Okay, so my first impression on this, it's not the thing that gets Maven so upset. And maybe she'll be able to join us if she has enough of that technological stuff. I can't upload uh, bandwidth, something like that. Because I would like to get her take on it. But what I see happening is uh, Kyle is being forced to recognize that you know your crap, Joe. You know this stuff, and you know it better than he does. And you talk about, he talks about the um, 1826 trial, and you go, well, Joseph Smith Papers Project, and this is what it says, and $10 fee. Okay, we'll go to something else. And then, um, oh, yes, yeah, so even some of the apostles, you know, with the polygamy, say, you say John... Taylor Jr., who I probably said John W. Taylor. We're talking about the same guy. And yeah, absolutely. And you know this stuff. Bam, bam, bam. And at this point, he's got to recognize that he's talking with somebody who is more than just your average Joe. Oh, that's good. You're the above average Joe. You are his worst nightmare. You know what you're talking about. And he, you know more than he does. And he's if he hasn't recognized it before now, he's recognizing it now, I believe. And this is one of the things that makes it very difficult for him. I did want to say something about polygamy. It was messy getting in. It was messy getting out. How the hell is that a defense? I don't understand how that amounts to some kind of a, a defense of the act of polygamy. It was messy getting in, but it was messy getting out too. Therefore, hey, it's okay. It's not. Maven. <laughs> Am I coming through okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So there was so much wrong with everything he said. It was really hard to transcribe that part because I, I kept stopping just to be like, what? So am I still coming in through okay? Perfect. Okay. All right. So I guess if I were to just 
pick one thing. I, my biggest problem is justifying the marriage, the child marriage of Helen Mark Kimball by saying, well, if the parents consent, it's legal and it's fine. And I, I, just the fact that he's just like, I went to a marriage. I, I, I've attended one with an underage girl. So the man was not underage, just the one, just the girl. And uh, he said, you know, same thing. It was legal because the parents were okay with it. So I guess two things. Um, child brides are a problem, period. And 90 I, I'm making up a statistic here, but most of the time, these children are not getting themselves married. They're not the ones pushing this along. Every once in a while, you might get a real precocious teenager that's really sure she's in love, but the majority of underage marriages for women, uh, children, are pushed by parents and often the husband. So anyway, so... I just, I mean, I'd like to think the best case scenario for this wedding that Kyle McKay attended was a 17 and 11 month year old um, girl with like an 18 year old and one month guy and that it was totally, completely wanted by them and the parents were just begged by both of them because they're really in love. Um, I think we know it's probably, I don't know, I I just it just blew my mind that I mean, first of all, if if that is the case, you know, in, it's not the same as what happened to Helen Mark Kimball. So the fact that he would try to like make it kind of the same, like, you know, it's fine. And then, of course, the whole like it was Heber C. Kimball's idea. Like, right, 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 mm -hmm. right. How 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 is he where he is right now? <laughs> I just. It just I just made me really upset. That's it. That's that's my piece. Mm -hmm. To your point, Maven, when he says it's Heber C. Kimball who pushed for that, he leaves out the fact that Heber C. Kimball was pressured by Joseph Smith to let Heber C. Kimball's wife marry Joseph first. Then Joseph plays the game of like, oh, just kidding, but I will take your yeah. daughter. And then Heber C.'s like, oh, yeah, let's do that. The other thing, right. too, is uh, Elder McKay. It doesn't matter. It, no, it it's, it's all gross. It is, too, in exchange, if, I think. If, if, if it was Heber C. Kimball's idea to still gross. marry off his 14-year-old, it's still problematic. And I think this is why I feel like Mormonism can be just so insidious, is that a, that a man like Kyle McKay cannot see the problem here, that he just it, – it's astounding yeah how bad something can be and and how common it is for Mormon men to just be like, well, well, you know, it's, it's kind of awkward, but like, eh. you know, I, Keith Erickson, I think you guys covered this. There was a, he was in a fireside and he was, he started to say something like, boy, if the prophet said, to, you know, to start polygamy again, and I had to bury a teenager. And then he just kind of left that off. He left that hanging because there's no good way to answer that. He's just like, Phew. you know, it's just like, what's the rest of the sentence? You would? It's you would either, have a hard of course time I with would, it, or you no would way it. in hell. Yeah. yeah, but you can't say no way in hell, right? Any good man should be able to say no way in hell. Would mm -hmm. I marry a teenager? Doesn't matter who's asking me. But Erickson couldn't say that either. He, yeah. it's, it just boggles my mind. Yeah. That Kyle I'm, McKay could have said that so casually. Just, it was fine. It was her dad's idea. Yeah. What's the problem? Yeah. She was 14. Yeah. That's the fucking problem. Yeah. I'm, anyway. I, I'm thinking of Lucy Walker, Maven. I know, I know that story yeah. so well. Lucy Walker's 15 years old. Her mother dies. Uh, Joseph Smith comes along, sends dad on a mission, takes the oldest kids into his home, the youngest of which is the two sisters, Lucy Walker and her sister. Joseph takes the daughters out into public and presents them as his own daughters. Hey, everyone, these are my daughters. You have to answer the question. And then shortly thereafter, uh, when she's 16 years old, uh, requires her to enter an intimate relationship, gives her 24 hours to pray about it. She comes back, not able to make a decision. Of course, she would have been up all night and not slept. Joseph says, I'll give you 24 more hours. And if you don't decide to do it, the gates of heaven shall be closed against you. She comes back after another 24 hours. Imagine how much she slept that night. I guarantee she didn't sleep that night either. She comes back after 48 hours of no sleep in a high pressure situation where you either have to believe 
that God initiates a father-daughter dynamic and then requires it to change into a husband-wife dynamic, or you have to accept that Joseph Smith is bullshitting. And either way, I can't accept Mormonism because I can't accept a God who would do that, and I can't accept his prophet doing it either. It makes no sense. And so, Elder McKay, until you can address questions like that, you're probably just better off keeping your mouth shut. And I think that is what he tries to do is not address the questions. And maybe that's because at some level he recognizes that these responses of his are not adequate to resolve this to a reasonable person like I Joe. Mean, they're adequate if you don't care about the experiences of the women, if you don't care about the 15-year-old that's living in a house Amen. with a man who's propositioning her to marry him secretly behind his wife's back, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. You if keep you, saying they don't maybe. matter. We, we're taught in Mormonism to say young women. We, yeah. we constantly, when we te- think of teenage girls in Mormonism, we say women because we've been we've been programmed to do so. These are girls. These are underage yes, girls. Point. I from age twelve, I was being called a young woman. Like that is the program. It's so, all grooming. Yeah, it, it's just it's just so bad. But I almost wonder if Kyle McKay would say that. Well, Joseph Smith was her father, so we've got the father's permission again. Now it's just <laughs> that makes it okay. If we can, if it's Warren Jeffs fine. can talk a dad into giving a daughter to him, it's okay. I would it's add um, on a at least at least some of the church historians and those that are looking at the situation in 2023. Patrick Mason um, recently putting himself in this situation said that to him it looks like sin and oh. that uh, uh, he he hopes that if he had been there in 1843 that he would have said no um, that as a yes. as a father he would have stood up for his own child. That really bothered me too. I was. I was listening live behind the scenes on that interview and I, I love Patrick Mason for what he does, but I just could not get that out of my mind for days when he, because it was your question, Bill, right? I think it was your question, John Dillon read, and it was, you know, it, knowing what you know, would you allow your teenage daughter to live or work in the Smith home? That was the question. And that, that he answered Joe, that you, you summarized really well was that he, he hoped, he said, I hope, I hope I could say no. And that's the best he could do. I mean, at least he's being honest. And if, if I were to give him more credit here, I think I can because um, because I, I also, just from my study of anthropology and, and then also just conflict resolution, I think what Patrick Mason was trying to do was is we don't always know necessarily what we would do in X or Y situation. And so I think that's the most credit I can give Patrick is that he hopes that he would not have been, you know, back then, with different information and different stuff. That's, that's, I hope that's making sense. That's the most credit I can give him. Yeah. The question it raises to me is how can you consistently, how can you say no to Joseph Smith in 1842, but say yes to the same Joseph Smith in 2023? And here's the thing. If that made sense. Joseph Smith didn't take no very well anyway. No, you're out of the church so, as soon as you say no. Ask James yeah, Brewster. So, right. Or or um oh, I just forgot which which Nancy it was. And I think also wasn't Martha Rigdon. um yeah, Nancy Rickton and then Martha, didn't she also Brotherton. she was also another one that rejected Brotherton Joseph Smith. So um and even men too. I did you I, I think Joseph Smith knew I mean, first of all, if it was a strong rejection, then yeah, you were out. He would immediately start working to undermine you and just get you out. But but if there was weakness, I think if he could kind of sense that, I hope, uh, probably not. I don't mm, I don't think so, Joseph. That makes me a little uncomfortable. He knew to have patience and keep working on it. I mean, that's the whole thing with Lucy Walker. Like, she said no. He was just like, let's try it again. <laughs> Go back to the drawing right? board. One more day. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Just, okay. That wasn't the right answer. Let's try it again. That's it. He would do that with men too. I mean, that's what he did with Heber C. Kimball. Like, you know, anyway. Do you remember RFM? We used to be taught all the time. You couldn't have a a live branch from a dead tree. So how do you build a living church off of a pedophile? Well, I wouldn't choose to use that term, but if we're just saying, (laughs) no, we we borrowed that from uh, that's Catholic. 
how do you get how do you get a living profit from a predatory person of children um i just predator of everybody he wasn't really let's just start with children advantage of everyone yeah yeah and i don't know i don't have a good answer to that if it were jacob hansen one does i'm looking at you jacob hope you're watching um, what he would say is it doesn't matter because they have the keys of the priesthood and it's the best. So regardless of what Joseph Smith did or did not do, it doesn't affect whether the church is true, which is Jacob's own personal way of trying to get to the desired conclusion without dealing with any of the evidence to get there. Yeah. And Elder McKay, if we, if you lived in 1843 and Joseph Smith wanted your daughter to work in his home, would you let her? And if you wouldn't, then why is Joseph Smith still a prophet? You just hit it, RFM. You said, if you don't trust Joseph Smith in 1843, why are you trusting him in 2023? Okay, hmm. I, yeah, I guess we'll be ending the, uh, the podcast tonight with that. Oh. It's hard to do better than that. No, I'm just no, kidding. I, Maven, did you have something I think you wanted to add? something like we hit on all the time, but I just, I hate that he's like, well, we don't know, like, if there was a sexual relationship. Like, it's just, it's only in Doctrine and Covenants 132 that the whole entire purpose of it is to raise seed, which requires sex. And so um, the whole bit about like, well, well, Joseph Smith wasn't very good at it. I was just like, what? <laughs> What? Yeah, Maven, and that was another beautiful part for Joe because Joe says, "Well, your own church essay says he had sex with him." Yeah. And then the whole point. Kyle has I to just... shift immediately. He goes to something else, and right. he talks about their age or something, and the parents consent. Right. I just well, I just hate I just hate that we don't know if they had sex or not. Apologetic, and it's just like yes. I don't, you know, really, really, it's we don't know if a marriage that's by revelation, I mean, it's a marriage, first of all, but also by specifically by revelation, by design is to raise up seed. We don't, we, we can't say, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch. We can't, you know, it's just like, no, it's not. It's not a stretch. It's not, it, not at all. It's the stupidest thing. They would never allow it for anybody else outside of Joseph Smith. Outside by the, the way, church. that argument fails, Maven, because let's just set Joseph Smith aside. Let's go to Brigham Young. Let's right. go to John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff and the the argument that they didn't have sex with underage children, you might be able to sort of create enough space that it's the less than most rational answer, but maybe, maybe. But soon as you right. go to Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, the argument fails. Those men were having sex with underage children. And right. I, I and like Facebook this Facebook used- comment oh go ahead yeah. me and i was just gonna <laughs> comment on that too it said why is it okay for women to marry into a non-sexual relationship um and that's okay it's not okay and agreed it's the, even if it's not that still does not solve anything it's still manipulative and horrible so yeah well and i would just add that the the textual evidence or at least the historical evidence the the women that were married to joseph smith um they testified under oath that those relationships were sexual and the church used those testimonies um, Brigham used those testimonies. These are faithful women that were married to Joseph Smith. Um, so if we're going to believe Brigham, if we're going to believe those women, um, then it's, I mean, it, this isn't even a discussion. Right. And this is, once again, you've got this entire uh, collage mosaic, mosaic is a better word, of all this bad conduct by church leaders. And what typically happens is you go over here as an apologist to make an argument about this that's completely contradicted by everything else in the mosaic. <clears throat> but if you can keep it focused over here, your argument will go as long as the other person doesn't bring up the other stuff over here. And that's something that you kept doing, Joe, and I just noticed this pattern, is there's an assertion by Kyle, and then there's a response from you with factual information that contradicts his assertion and then there's an immediate movement by Kyle to another issue. I'm not sure he ever actually stayed with you long enough to actually talk about any particular issue that you raised. And maybe that's what he was going for. I don't know. But I did notice that pattern. Did you notice it, Joe? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and I was fine to push that along and, and not stay on any one of those specific areas. Um, as I said at the beginning of my document, and as I said, you know, the beginning of the night, my point isn't even um, a specific doctrine. I don't, 
I mean, if we want, we can sit here and talk about the book of Abraham for five hours. But my my whole point is the the view from 20,000 feet tells a story that you it's the only thing you can see. It's this is how this is what's happening. You talk about plural marriage by itself. Um, then then let's talk about plural marriage. But if you connect plural marriage to the temple, to Adam and Diamond, to the Book of Mormon, to the Book of Abraham, and you put them all together, step back and look at what it is, um, you see, you see they're all connected. They're all following the same pattern, um, his inspired eclecticist concept. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he's just he's he's just grabbing everything from the the world around him. At, at the moment that it comes into his attention and he's placing it into an ancient um, religious paradigm. And he, he does it from the, 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 the beginning of his story until the end of his story. And, and there is no deviation from that paradigm. Yeah. And Dan Hardy, I won't be reading your comments unless you come into YouTube because you put it on Facebook and then it doesn't really get a chance to get any pushback from the folks in the live chat. I would just suggest you said last time you come over to YouTube, please do that. I'm not going to read that, my friend. At yeah, argument, Dan Hardy, just... please. We roll out the red carpet for you. Please join the party. Yeah, we'd love if you called going in on at YouTube face uh, YouTube live chat. You're going to love it, and yeah. people are going to love you. Oh yeah. Are we ready for the next clip? Yeah. Can I just make a little plea for donations really quick, RFM? I will not stand in your way. Okay. So folks, uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3. We survive on the donations of listeners. This week's episode to me is profound. Um, I I can't, I can't imagine the impact this will have if folks are listening and really trying to wrestle with this stuff and understanding how big the problem is. Last week we had Gordon B. Hinckley throwing Joseph Smith under the bus, uh, RFM, Uh, myself, Maven, I think we put a hell of a show together for Mormonism Live. Uh, Hit the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel. But if I can just put a plea out, we've had donations drop off a little bit. Um, I think we're on the kind of a front end or maybe sort of into a recession. If anybody out there has the capability to please donate, again, you can pick whatever podcast we would, I'm going to suggest Mormonism Live. Uh, It's our biggest show on our, our, um, under our umbrella. If you go to mormondiscussionpodcast.org, click the donate button, five bucks a month. 10 bucks a month. I don't care. Um, But those donations add up and they give us the resources that folks like Radio Free Mormon can spend his time and energy researching these kinds of things, reaching out to folks like Joe, putting time clips together and putting what I think is the best uh, historical examination show in Mormonism that's going on today. And so folks, please consider donating to the podcast. And again, if a recurring donation is most appreciated, but all the donations, we thank you so, so much. And we'll just keep putting out programs like this. And I see donations coming in. Uh, Maven's throwing some of those up on the screen. Thank you. Um, and we're super excited to just keep putting out content, but we do need donations to keep doing the things that we do for, for the coming years. Thank you. And thank you, Bill. And thank you for all of our great listeners who support this show. We Amen. really appreciate you. I appreciate you. Amen. Are we ready for clip number eight? We got three more left, and then there's a little bit more to the story, and you're not going to want to miss the bombshell that happens after. No, there's always good bombshells at the end, isn't there? Oh yeah, kaboom! It was the. It's what appears to me to be the the intentional Uh, line. I mean, so here's I I taught I taught the party line as well as anybody taught the party line. Um, I did not ever teach or have access through any of the correlated curriculum to what the real it's a different picture you know what i mean and the church is like look if you're if you're painting a picture that's not very accurate you're not being very honest and that's a short Mm -hmm. clip and maybe mercifully because some of these others have been long but i can't get enough of this and i can't get enough of just picturing you standing there were you sitting or standing sitting sitting there in your living room across from the church historian and just telling the truth directly to him when you're saying there's two different pictures and the correlated history that the church gives us has very little relationship with real history what was kyle looking like at this point or at any point that you can remember um he always remained composed um he seemed comfortable um honestly uh, he uh he never appeared bored um he was professional. He was kind. At no point did I think, oops, I've said something that's offensive. 
um, or he's uncomfortable and just wants to get out of here. He, he was always very attentive to what I was saying. He is a good guy. Okay. So is there anything else that you wanted to say about that clip? Um, I, you know, I would like to say it, and I'll, and I'll try to make this kind of quick because I don't want to go backwards. Um, but the, the curriculum is moving um, slowly in the right direction. Um, but I, to give you an example, the, the, the Saints, um, the Saints books, the series of books, um, it's, it's in my mind, it's going the right direction and it's a little better uh, as far as, you know, painting an accurate picture. The problem is it's not entirely accurate and it's giving members of the church, um, some of them, not all of them, but it's giving some members of the church an overinflated sense of accomplishment when they read saints, they feel like they've done the heavy lifting and the burden is now gone. And they, I know the hard things I've read the hard things. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's an oculation and it's working. Um, but unfortunately I think it's creating, um, some conflicts when, you know, a person who read saints is going to watch this podcast and, and think that we're making stuff up because they read saints. You know, we're talking about just a minute ago, we were just talking about plural marriage. Would you let Joseph Smith, you know, um, have your daughter in the home? Someone who read Saints is going to go, well, yeah. I mean, I, I see the problem that was there, but I still trust him completely. Um, it's, I, I don't know, the, we're moving the curriculum in the right direction. Um, but still, I think it's creating, it's creating a false sense of, of accomplishment that someone's actually, they've actually looked into the situation, they've read it, they understand it, and now they don't have to think about it anymore. Can I say that recently I've been trying to look at this from your father-in-law's point of view because here he's got the hired gun. I think I mentioned this before. He brings him in to answer your questions, obviously hoping for a good outcome, which would be you coming back to church and the, your family coming back to church. But very shortly after this whole conversation starts, this is what I imagine, okay? I imagine your father-in-law probably does not know church history as well as you do. He probably doesn't know it as well as Kyle does. And he probably doesn't know it as well as pretty much anybody who's watching this show knows it. He's, he's basically your standard Mormon, and he's been faithful, and he's worked his way up to being a state president. So good for him. But he's brought in the guy who's supposed to answer the questions, and he's supposed to tell you where you're wrong and where you've got it wrong. And all I can do is imagine him sitting there, and thinking, what strange world have I entered into where, first off, these two guys are talking a foreign language. And they're talking the language of church history. And they both appear to be fluent in it. And I can understand the words they're saying, but I've got no idea about half of the stuff they're talking about. And the real thing that's striking me, if I'm imagining myself as your father-in-law, the state president, is where is the point where the church historian sets Joe straight? Because it sounds like they're all agreeing on these aspects of church history. In fact, there was only one thing he could bring up, and that was about um, whether it was a conviction or whether it wasn't a conviction in the 1826 Bainbridge trial, right? And who the heck cares? But that's the only thing, and then you came back with Joseph Smith Papers Project. Everything else is agreement. Kyle, the church historian, is not disagreeing with you. And I just think that must have been frustrating, confounding, and unexpected on the part of the state president? Um, you know, I, I have no idea um, what was going through his head. Um, I, I would imagine that you're correct, um, that he probably saw a different um, dialogue, a different conversation and a different outcome. That being said, um, from the apologetic standpoint, um, or from the apologist standpoint, um, you can easily, just see this as a guy, me, who's got a lot of big words, who's done a lot of studying, who probably is looking beyond the mark. Um, he's got an agenda. He's frustrated. And and then you've got a general authority who is kindly, patiently allowing him to um, say what he needs to say. And and at some point, you don't engage. You just go, what? you know, wrestling with a pig, that kind of concept. It, at what, it's not going to do anyone good. This guy's got his mind made up. I can see he's got his mind made up. Let's just, let's not damage a relationship by being contradicting, by trying to correct him. Let's love. Um, and 
And and maybe that's what maybe that's what Kyle McKay was thinking. I mean, maybe he really had all the answers and he was like, I don't want to start a fight. No, he's got nothing. And I would agree with you, except for the fact that you asked the specific question of Kyle to say, if I've got anything wrong, please let me know. And that was a key question. Because when he came up with nothing, except for that one minor quibble, and you came back with the Joseph Smith papers on the 1826 Bainbridge trial, and whether it was a conviction or whether it was not, that had to signal to anybody paying even marginal attention to what was going on, that the church historian had no other disagreement with any of the laundry list of things that you were talking about. My take. Bill, did you have anything you wanted to say before we go to the next clip? No, I, uh, oop, I just I started that. No, I don't have anything else. Um, this, by the way, I thought you did phenomenal. As I'm hearing all this put together, it becomes crystal clear in an episode like this that it is just one thing after the other, and every one of them on their own is damning. Yeah, you are Tanya Harding to Kyle McKay's Nancy Kerrigan. And then some. You ready? Oh, yeah, please. Let's do it. It's what appears to me yeah. to be the, the intentional. Oh, this one we already did, right? Oh, yeah, we're on nine now. Good catch. So now, now, you're, now you're with John Locke. And he made this observation. And, I'm, I, and we're all subject to it. We are all subject to this. Um, and he was he was a skeptic. I mean, he was sure. he was he was kind of anti-religion, in fact. And it was for this reason, or at least this is one of the reasons he, he identified the difficulty that some people or maybe all people have distinguishing between, quote, the delusions of Satan and the inspirations of the Holy Ghost. Satan, he said, can transform himself into an angel of light. And they who are led by this son of the morning are as fully satisfied of the illumination, are as strongly persuaded that they are enlightened by the Holy Spirit as anyone who is so. They acquiesce and rejoice in it, are prompted in their actions by it, and nobody can be more sure or more in the right than they, close quote. So, so it's, it's, I believe in, well, first of all, I believe in the law of opposites, that there is a powerful spiritual communication from God or, or the possibility of, and and also from the from the other side the opposition yeah so so I <laughs> I hope you would allow for that and then just hang 100% just yeah hang, just hang in there but but I would tweak your journey into what what am I going to have faith in right. what do I believe maybe that'll be a good answer right. what do I firmly irrefutably undeniably it's just in my soul I believe this, and I hope it is. There is a God in heaven, and Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. I hope that's there. Okay, so I'm going to start this discussion. I'm going to take a break here for a couple minutes, but I want to start with this question. Is that uh, Kyle knows this quote by John Locke, who is apparently an atheist, at least that's what he said, and I'm sorry I don't know the gentleman well enough, uh, but let's just say he was. It doesn't make any difference if he were an atheist. But it is this quote that Kyle knows about John Locke saying that the, the perennial problem, right, with religion is that this difficulty, maybe this impossibility of the adherence of a religion, discerning the difference between the delusions of Satan versus the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And what I cannot get my head around is why Kyle McKay is using that quote in any discussion in defense of the church because it seems to me to undercut his position completely any thoughts um a couple one i think john locke was one of the early great thinkers of you know 200 years ago i think the the founding fathers often he was one of the the resources or the sources that they would use in, in trying to come up with things you know federalist papers that kind of stuff john locke anyway um i i want to say this that the the assumption that i am under the influence of um satan 
I'm under the influence of um, something other than the spirit when I'm having a spiritual experience or a feeling or an emotion um, that is contrary to what the church teaches. Um, that's the first thought that comes through my mind. I mean, that was my, you know, when I began 10 years ago going down the, the wrong road concept. Um, yeah, that's, that is the first, I mean, think any member of the church um, would have that, would be trained to have that as an immediate knee-jerk reaction to, okay, so what, then where did this come from? Is this me? Is this, you know, is this the spirit or is, am I, have I been deceived? Um, I think that's built into our, our theology. Um, I've thought about it since, and here I am 10 years later, and that's still a possibility um, that I, I mean, I, I keep that in the, you know, one in a million chance, but sure, it's, it's a chance. So my point in the entire um, discussion is because it's a 1% chance, I am not going to rely upon my feelings at all. I'm going to eliminate um, my emotion and my feeling from uh, from making any major decisions as if that feeling is the source of truth. Um, I am now going to lean on documents, on evidence, on everything that I can um, to make decisions because I don't trust my feelings because it's possible that I could be under the influence of, of something other than the Holy Ghost. Um, and so logic becomes my guiding light. Uh, and, and so the point that he's making, um, whether or not I want to agree with it or disagree with it or whether or not I think it's fair, he's, he's, he's basically making my point back saying, yeah, that's why I can't trust it. Right. That was my sense, too. It's like it's an argument for reason. And not to go with your feelings. And yet he seems to be using, I don't know why he's bringing it up, honestly. I can't get my head around it. Because even if he's not using it for the purpose of relying on reasoning, instead of spiritual feelings, which can be confused, still, what he's saying is that Satan could be deceiving Kyle McKay just as easily as he could be deceiving you. Mm -hmm. The way he worded it, he it was almost like he acknowledged this idea that Everything's bad over there, but there's some good things over here. I mean, like, here's all the garbage in the church. Watch this. I thought, oh, look, I've got a dollar. Look, wow. Like, it doesn't solve the problem. You still have the garbage. You still have the mess, and you don't want to touch it. You just want to say, like, there's some good things happening. Well, guess what? Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, they've got a dollar, too, and they got all this. It still doesn't answer the problem, which is if the church is true, we have to have a solution for the things that are right direct hits to our truth claims and the integrity of the leaders of the church. And if you can't solve that, it doesn't matter that you've got a little bit of good feelings. A lot of people have that. It doesn't matter that people have some answered prayers. All the spiritual systems have people who have those. You're not fixing anything. And as you guys said, the logic of that actually makes it worse. Hmm. Yeah. Are we ready for the 10th clip and the final clip? Here it is. Hiding. Put your trust in him. Go build, go build faith and have all the reasons to doubt that you need to work through. And you don't have to look for him. The fact that you knew 99% of it tells me that somebody wasn't doing a very good job of hiding it. I trust, trust me. I don't think very many people had access to some of those records. Okay. Or Lachlan Mackay. Okay. Or well, so, Zealous so, Mound. Yeah. Thank you for responding to him in that way, Joe, because once again, it's this BS response, which I heard from, uh, what was it? It was Elder, uh, it was Oaks who was up there with Elder Ballard and talking about how old was that Improvement Era article with the first vision, the 1832 account in it? Oh, 1970. And Elder Oaks goes, well, we've been hiding that for a long time now. <laughs> Still hiding it. Yeah. And so this is the same thing. Well, you knew about 99% of it, even though I know you said 90%. He remembered it as 99%. But regardless, it's a lot of stuff that you said you knew as a seminary teacher. And the fact that you knew all this shows that the church, somebody, he means the church, isn't doing a very good job of hiding it, right? And you immediately said, well, you know, most members don't have access to all this stuff and this material and these relationships 
that I have, and that's uh, the Lachlan McKay relationship, right? And immediately, bam, and he had to stop because he knew he'd gone too far. It seems like Kyle has a lot of slogans, but not a lot to back them up. Mm. He's a bumper sticker church historian. Why do you think, RFM, that all church historians are either lawyers or general authorities to begin with, or both? Why? Well, we'll Do you think that, that there's an attorney-client privilege? Part of the position is I we bring you in as a church historian, but we're also sort of signing you as our lawyer. Hence, we have attorney-client privilege. Hence, you're very limited on what you could say if we don't want you to say it. I don't know if that's the case, but it's, it is a pattern that is so prevalent that it's hard to argue that there are probably is a reason that they're choosing lawyers to be their church historians. Hmm. And I do think it's because, actually, I'm going to agree with uh, Elder Packer on this, that it's because a lawyer has a duty to his client. And a lawyer who divulges secrets that he's learned in representing his client would be unethical. Hmm. And I think that's the paradigm that they're going from. Yeah, so no matter what he does, he would be unethical, but... Yes. That's the thing he's done his whole life and been loyal to. So that's the lesser of two evils in his mind, loyalty over integrity. Right. And I'll say once again that historians do a lot of things. Lawyers do a lot of things as part of their jobs. But at the bottom, one of the main things that lawyers do, I should say historians do, is they find things. And one of the main things that lawyers do is they hide things. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so was that the last one that we did? That was the 10th one. That's all of them. All right. Joe, can you take us to the following night? Sure. Which is so, Sunday, April 23rd. Go ahead. Yep. Um, part, of our, part of our discussion um, was, you know, he, he extended the invitation for me to, to come to church, to come to state conference the next day. Um, and uh, I turned it down. Um, he invited invited us to come to his uh, fireside that he was doing. It was a regional fireside that night. Um, and I told him I'd think about that, that I thought that would be, that'd be very interesting. Um, and so we went, um, and, and I went as a, um, as an act of good faith as an olive branch. I mean, I, he came to my home, spent a couple hours. I, I genuinely thought, you know what, I, we can go and sit and listen to his fireside. I certainly was not going to, um, to, you know, to be a critic in the back or to be second guessing or to have him nervous that I was going to, you know, whatever I, I wanted to go and, and, and be a, a faithful participant and let him know, um, that I was appreciative. So I went fireside was great. Um, and uh, a couple hours long. Yeah. And the fireside was actually pretty boring because I've listened to it. Cause you taped it as well. And, yes. um, the fact is, is that uh, Kyle got up there, I think he's a good speaker, but he, all he wanted to do was just talk about the nuts and bolts of what the church historian's office does and kind of in a strange um, turn of events, and it was very uh, nostalgic for me. All of a sudden, he's talking about people, the members, keeping records. And he hit on that a few times, and I thought, what, is this Spencer W. Kimball time again in journal keeping? Because I haven't heard that in a long time. But he did talk about that. He talked about just what you do in the different departments and blah, blah, blah. And then they opened it up to Q&A. So there's some questions and answers. You weren't going to ask any questions because your job isn't there to be a disruptor. You're just there to be um, courteous. But something interesting happened when somebody else had asked Kyle about, I think it was a question about Thomas Marsh and ending up in Texas Lime, or something. Lyman White. It was at Lyman White. Okay. And ending up in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And tell us what happened there. So um, someone asked a random question about Lyman White. They'd been in, they'd been in Texas, saw some sort of a, a placard, and, and it had Lyman's name on it. He asked, you know, as a church historian, what happened to Lyman White? Where did he end up as a member? Um, that kind of stuff. Um, and he, uh, he didn't know the answer. And I don't know that there's a – I mean, I don't know exactly what the question needed. I mean, Lyman White ended up in Texas, apparently. Um, I used Lyman White in my, in my, my paper – um, with regards to priesthood ordinations. And so, you know, just a couple of days earlier, the day earlier, he and I had discussed Lyman White. So I think when he heard the name Lyman White um, and a random question that his default thought of me. And what happened? 
he paused the, uh, the, the moment in the, in the question and answer and said, you know, um, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm also not the only historian in the room. Um, and then he looked to me and he said, Joe, would you like to answer that? Can you help me out? Um, and, uh, I said, no, <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> Good decision. Oh my gosh. Now I want to say a couple things about this. First off, I want to say that Kyle doing that just evokes fondness for yeah, me because I think that's a cool move to make and to call you out and say, you know, I'm, what he's saying, he's deferring to your expertise over mm -hmm. his own. He's and admitting think, you've been right the whole time. I think that's more than an olive branch. I think that's a very mm -hmm. cool thing. But I also have to ask you this question. Joe, was your father-in-law present? Was he on the stand, the state president? Because yeah. mm -hmm. once again, I'm wondering what the heck's going through his mind. Because I think he's like, I have officially entered the twilight zone now. My rogue son-in-law, who has left the church for all the wrong reasons, is now being deferred to in public at a regional fireside by the church historian in front of everybody? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know what was going through his head. Uh, I would like to think that he was super proud of his son-in-law. <laughs> <So like, yeah. laughs> I got a feeling that's that's not what was going um, through his head. I don't know, uh, but I can only imagine that's a problematic thing to to legitimize me in in the eyes yes. of um, the stake or the region. Um, but yeah, Kyle but did that. And Kyle good did for it, him. and for whatever reasons, I thought it was genuine. I thought it was just a moment of of um, you know, hey, I I don't know. This guy seems to know a lot. Um, like I said, I I I have a lot of respect for for Elder McKay. I do too, you, Bill. Yeah, so if if Joe had been inaccurate about the history as he was sharing it a couple nights earlier, hmm. would it make any sense for Kyle McKay to call on Joe to correct a historical question? No, he was So it only makes sense, him. yep, it only makes sense if Kyle McKay understood Joe to be telling the absolute complete truth and to be accurate in his telling of the history of the church. And not only that, that he knew more things at a deeper depth than Kyle himself understood. True. Good point. Hmm. I happen to have been aware, or I think I'm aware, because I'm going from memory, that this place in Texas that Lyman White ended up with was New Braunfels. And that's where the plaque is, because I've seen the plaque. And the Mormons came in there, and they were having a heck of a time with some kind of disease or something, killing people off, all the, the German settlers in New Braunfels. And they came in there, and they helped out, and save some lives so good on them and good on Lyman White. Mm. Our best and brightest. Excuse me. Now, what happened after the fireside, Joe? Please tell us. Please. So, um, I think that was it and then we went home. Just kidding. RFM, <laughs> I'm messing with you. Um, no, I know cuz you're you're trying to get out of the building. The fireside's so yeah, over. The fireside's over. Um, and a line forms for people who want to go up and talk to, uh, to, uh, Elder McKay. And, uh, I, I was ready to get out, but I wanted, I wanted to make eye contact with him and just kind of give him the thumbs up. I wanted to end on a, a you know, on whatever, just salutations. Um, and, uh, and so as we were trying to get out of there, uh, um, he kind of pulled me aside I mean, we're, we're surrounded by people, but he pulled me in and says, yeah. I got, I've got some things I need to say to you. I've been thinking about, you know, last night I thought a lot about our meeting. Um, and especially about the part that I underscored before about how you said about lawyers represent the church mm -hmm. when they're the church historian. So he, he said, um, I, I want to address the, the claim that you made that, um, that I am a lawyer that represents the church. That is not true. Um, he says, I am, I am not currently practicing uh, law for the church. I, I'm not, a, the church has not hired me as a lawyer and they would, I'd be a horrible lawyer to hire because I, I worked in um, corporate accusation, you know, acquisition with, you know, grocery stores. Um, he said, that's just not it at all. Um, and he says, and I know that, that that's an idea that originated with my mission companion, Radio Free Mormon. And I, to be honest, I, I was stunned. Like, I was like, whoa, um, the, the last name 
I expected him to be bringing up was Radio Free Mormon. Um, and, and that wasn't necessarily what I was trying to drive out in my document in the first place. Um, that he was an actual lawyer for the church. It was just the difficult position that he found himself in. So, and I said that to him, I said, look, I, I want you to know that I am not, um, describing you as a lawyer is not a, is not a knock on you. I said, as a matter of fact, it's just me trying to explain why I think you're in such a hard position. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, and from what I understand, um, quoting Patrick Mason, that the general, um, Mormon studies community thinks that it's a pretty good idea to have a non-historian in that position simply because historians speak a different language um, than the bureaucracy, and he gets to translate between the two. Um, so I tried to, I tried to, to lessen that blow. Well, what do Somebody's you take asking, from that, that statement, Bill Real? Somebody's asking, did he say his actual name or did he say Radio Free Mormon? Radio Free mm, Mormon. Wow. I'm really happy to know that the church historian listens to Radio Free Mormon and remembers me oh, from Fukuyama man. because that was a great time and Kyle was a great yeah. trainer and I certainly yeah. remember him. Isn't that such an interesting dynamic, right? The two of you, it's almost like uh, this really cool <laughs> thing. You, uh, you spend every week deconstructing Mormonism, showing people the history, unrolling the, the irrational and illogical things that these guys do. And this guy who served with you in Japan becomes the church historian. It's apparent he listens and, oh, he's obfuscating and you're laying out the case beautifully week after week. One lawyer is losing and the other one is winning. And I love it. Oh, well, and in, in a, in a um, moment of, of poetic, irony um that that comment um was what made me reach out to radio free mormon um right. i never this was not on my on my radar i was not this was not my uh my my little plan to to tell this story i, I this was never going to be told um but i was so interested and then so i went and i went home and got on the google machine radio free mormon um Kyle McKay, like what on earth, what's going on here? Um, and it, it, it brought, it brought this entire concept into my worldview. Um, and I was just kind of blown away by the whole thing. And I just thought, man, Radio Free Mormon needs to know that, um, he, he's, uh, that I'm not going unobserved. Side. Yeah. And that I was the observed was of all observers. And so I reached out and we kind of just briefly shared some information. Mm -hmm. And then Radio Free Mormon says, we'd love you to tell your story. And I thought, no way. Um, but after, you know, after a couple of sleepless nights or whatnot, here we are. And I'm so glad that you did decide to come on the show and share this story, including this part. By the way, really quickly, I do have to tell... Kyle, that that thought is not original to me. I did get it from Boyd K. Packer in his talk, The Mantle is Far, Far Greater Than the Intellect, from the early 80s. And I'm just going to read this super quick, okay? Because I dismantled this in my very first episode, and I wonder if that's what Kyle is referring to. Maybe he listened to my first episode. It's like getting, you know, through maybe the first chapter of First Nephi when you're reading the Book of Mormon. I don't know if his listening to me is more extensive than that or if he relies on reports that are provided to him by the SCMC. But this is what it says. <clears throat> Boyd K. Packer, in likening the church historian who was Leonard Arrington at the time, with whom he was a little bit miffed for being, let's say, overly sharing and transparent about church hist history from Boyd K. Packer's point of view. Quote, suppose that a well-managed business corporation is threatened by takeover from another corporation. Suppose that the corporation bent on the takeover is determined to drain off all its assets and then dissolve the company. You can rest assured that the threatened company would hire a church historian to protect it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> would hire legal counsel to protect itself. Can you imagine? See, it's Boyd K. Packer who's drawing this parallel between the church historian and an attorney for a corporation. Can you imagine, he goes on, can you imagine that attorney under contract to protect the company, having fixed in his mind that he must not really take sides, that he must be impartial. 
Suppose that when the records of the company he has been employed to protect are opened for him to prepare his brief. He collects evidence and passes some of it to the attorneys of the enemy company. His own firm may then be in great jeopardy because of his disloyal conduct. Do you not recognize a breach of ethics or integrity or morality? See, that's the difference between an attorney who's representing a client versus a historian, but in Boyd T. Packer's mind, they're the same. And then he concludes by saying, I think you can see the point I am making. Oh yeah, I can see it, Boyd. Those of you who are employed by the church, and he's talking to all the CES people and all the SNI people, all the church teachers, those of you who are employed by the church have a special responsibility to build faith, not destroy it. If you do not do that, but in fact accommodate the enemy, who is the destroyer of faith, you become in that sense a traitor to the cause you have made covenants to protect. So the, the idea is not original to me. I wish I could claim it, but I got it from Boyd K. Packer, just for the record. Okay, so that kind of concludes that. And I know that somewhere in the discussion you had with Kyle, he said, look, maybe, I'll, or you had asked him about sending you an email through your father-in-law, but I think Kyle said at some point, I'll just write you. And mm -hmm. you did get a letter from Kyle, isn't that correct? Correct. That, and what's the date of the week. letter? Um, he sent it that same week. I can't remember the... I've got it right here. Let's see if there's a postmark on it. I know he's got it in here. You've got it. I'm sure of it. It's it probably is. somewhere. April it's probably somewhere. But um, and maybe we can pull it up. April 26th. Hopefully it doesn't have any incriminating information on it, or at least identifying information. We probably scrubbed all that. Cross fingers. But um, but yeah, it's a two page letter, and my reading of it is that Kyle did not use that time to correct you on any of your factual assertions about church history. Is that right? That is correct. So he basically tacitly agreed with everything you said. I would expect if you'd gotten something wrong that he would have pointed it out after he had a chance to run it by his top-notch church historians over whom he presides. But let me see here. Do we have that document and is it possible to put it on the screen? I don't, uh, I don't have it. Maven, if you've got it, let me s check my email real quick. I might be able to pull it up, though. I've got it, and I can, I can, I can reference it. I tell you what. Why don't you just go ahead and reference it? Is there anything on there with your last name on it, Joe, or your mailing on address? The, on, on the the copy that I sent you, there is not. But on on uh, okay. on the one that I've uh, on the one that uh, I've got in my hand, there is. All right. If you would start reading that. And we'll see if we can get a copy up for the audience to follow along, follow along while you're reading. Sure. Um, so it just says, uh, um, you've been on my mind since our visit last Saturday. Thank you for inviting us into your home and thank you for sharing your research and candid assessments. I very much enjoyed seeing you again at the multi-stake adult devotional Sunday evening. Sorry for putting you on the spot about Lyman White. But thank you for on your, your on-the-spot research. Um, and that's that was a conversation we had afterwards. Uh, I said, during our discussion in your home, a couple of things were said that probably merit some follow-up. And I hope you don't mind that I follow up with a short note. First, I want to reiterate my invitation for you to focus on faith. You entitled your research in defense of doubt. I would love to read your 10-page. Hey, look, there you are. Um, and that, I can read it right off your uh, screen. Um, so we're right there in that second paragraph. You entitled your research in defense of doubt. I would love to read your 10-page work entitled In Defense of Faith. I'm not asking you to defend the church. You're likely not a very good position to do that right now. Um, but I would like you to defend faith, your faith. You said you believe in God and Christ. Write down all the reasons why, even in the face of arguments to the contrary. Defend your faith to a disbeliever. I would love to read that. The second invitation I would like to extend is for you to patch up your relationship with the Holy Ghost. During our visit, you said that you don't trust the Holy Ghost because of a revelatory experience that you had that turned out to not be from God at all. You did not share the revelation that you had. In hindsight, you know absolutely that it was not from God. But if you know it was not from God, which means it was not from the Holy Ghost, then I'm not sure what can come from ceasing to trust the Holy Ghost, as though he gave you the false information. Well, what else are you supposed to conclude from that? It, this goes back to the Locke quote. I mean, it's the same, it's the same concept. 
Yeah, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I also don't want to let a lot of this just pass by because I won't remember it. It just seems to me that putting the burden on you to patch up your relationship with the Holy Ghost when the Holy Ghost is the one who was not truthful to you seems to be putting the burden on the victim. And I think it's up to the Holy Ghost to patch up his or her relationship with you. That's my perspective. Sure. I mean, it would be it would be the same as if if, if I got scammed, you know, on online, um, some bank. I got a text message from my bank saying, you know, you're there's been a, a hack. And, and, and then I man, I, I give them all my information. Um, well, of course, I'm not going to be upset with uh, my bank at the end of the day, but I'm no longer going to trust any um, texts that come through into my life anymore. I'm just going to go. I can't. If there's no way for me to figure out if this is coming from my bank or some random person, the only banking I'm going to do is when I walk into the building, what right. I can physically see and handle. And so, um, and then, and then it would basically say, you know, it was your fault. You got scammed. Well, probably, but that doesn't change my, doesn't change my ability to analyze and use um, my feelings moving forward. So, yeah. And I don't want to be guilty of re asking for consistency on the part of Kyle, but after he's quoted from John Locke, about the impossibility of telling the difference between inspiration of God versus Satan. I don't know why you would want to patch up your relationship with the Holy Ghost at all, since apparently things are set up in the cosmos such that Satan can come in and perfectly duplicate his messaging. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if the Holy Ghost and I can have a, a relationship and I can, I can quantifiably differentiate between that and any other feeling, then yeah, I, then let's patch that relationship up. But if I'm not given the tools to do that, right? I'm, I'm getting catfished yeah. by by Satan. Exactly. I wouldn't throw the Holy Ghost. I wouldn't trust the Holy Ghost as far as I could throw him. Well, he doesn't have a body, so you can't throw him. One lawyer is better at critical thinking than another. One lawyer has all the facts on his side and all the evidence on his side. <clears throat> that, that's all it is. I don't take any credit for it. So go ahead. Please continue with your letter. Okay. Or his letter. Um, your reading of his letter. Sure, sure. Um, I have learned by experience and observation that we do two things that make ourselves easy prey for the adversary. First, we say that Satan cannot duplicate or create peace. Lucifer can duplicate anything God does or has, but he can come it says he cannot duplicate anything God does or has, but he can come nigh unto, quote, duplicating pretty much everything God does or has. He is a master mimic. I have worked with people who have had profound revelations that align with their understanding of revelation because of how they felt. But they've been deceived. Lucifer can prompt. He can reveal. The great safety net in this process is the word of God as revealed in the scriptures by the living prophets. I recently listened to a sermon preached by a Protestant minister about hearing God's voice. Among other things, he said, quote, the voice of God will never contradict the word of God. Close quote. Sound advice. The second thing that Latter-day Saints do to make ourselves easy or easier pray for the adversary is to misread the account of Nephi slain Laban. By the that way, can I just say that whole paragraph, that whole argument says you can't trust the Holy Ghost. So all you have to do is align yourself with what the leaders of the church say. 100% correct. Okay, please continue. The second thing Latter-day Saints do to make ourselves easier, easier pray for adversaries to misread the account of Nephi slain Laban. The experience does not stand for the proposition that the spirit can or will prompt you to do something contrary to God's revealed word. So there Nephi is no commandment that says thou shalt not kill. Got it. Nephi shrank not because of some moral dilemma arising from conflicting commands. Rather, in his own words, he shrank because he was young and he'd never taken a man's life. He was bumping up against a part of God's law that he had never been confronted, that had, he had never been confronted. And then switch to the next page. With? Or, oh, down with, to the yeah, next okay. page. <laughs> Here we are. I couldn't I there was a preposition coming. With, that he'd been confronted with. In Doctrine and Covenants 98, the Lord says in essence, quote, if someone tries to kill you once, forgive them. If they try to kill you twice, forgive them. But at really? some point, if they keep coming at you, I will deliver them into your hands and you're justified at ending it. Close quote. If someone um, tries to kill me once, I'm killing them. Sorry. Amen. 
Self-defense. I understand. The Lord identified this as the law that he gave unto a servant, Nephi, Doctrine and Covenants 98, 32. Numerous people, including a close and prominent friend, have been duped because they received a powerful spiritual manifestation that tells them to do something contrary to God's law. And they think it's from God because, hey, Nephi, you have probably already thought through all of this. I simply share it here as part of an invitation to mend your relationship with the Holy Ghost. He is deserving of trust and you need his guidance. If you followed a prompting, not from him, it is you who needs to regain his trust, not vice versa. I hope that makes sense. Above all, and notwithstanding all, I hope that you will not feel condemned by me or anyone else in the church. I also hope that you will appreciate that my conviction of truth is a result of a multitude of spiritual experiences, none of which has required me to abandon logic or reasoning or turn a blind eye to the things that don't align perfectly with my beliefs. Thank you again for inviting us into your home. I wish you and your family all the best. Sincerely, Tom McKay. Okay. Well, that was a nice closing paragraph. I like that much. Go up to that first page. I want to see this quote again. I just want to see if this meshes with the actual history of the church. So it is where, um, no, no, yeah, that might be a little too far. Go towards the bottom of that page. Sorry. Okay. So right there. The voice of God will never contradict the word of God. And I th I'm thinking of Brigham Young and Adam God. I'm thinking of 1852 race ban that seemed to last for generation after generation where the leaders of the church and the members were sure that that was by the spirit, God's will. It seems as though the voice of God contradicts the word of God continually in Mormonism. Like those are just two examples. That's a great you know, point, Bill. And the only thing that highlights that even more is that right after he says the voice of God will never contradict the word of God, the very next paragraph, he tells the story about where the voice of God contradicted the word of God. <laughs> uh, and your for honor, those listening, that was the story about Nephi and Laban. Yeah. There are so many instances where leaders thought they had it right, thought they knew by the Spirit. The members also thought they knew the prophet was right. And then the church either abandons, disavows, or reverses the position. Which gives me the, the, the reason why I no longer trust my feelings as a barometer for absolute truth. And you shouldn't. All right. Well, we have had a long and fascinating, I think, evening talking about your interactions with the church historian, my former missionary companion. And I wanted to give the floor over to you, Joe, right now to tell us your thoughts about this experience and including your thoughts about this letter that was sent to you by Kyle. Um, well, so specific to the, the letter, um, I, I, was, I was pretty pumped to get it. Really, I was. And again, this is where I go. I, I think he's the right guy for the job. Um, do I agree with everything or do I... I mean, do I see problems with the logic? Of course I do. But the conversation is happening. Um, he's reaching out to me. Um, not that he may never reach out to me again, especially after tonight. And that's and I and I would hope that's not the case. I hope he doesn't feel condemned by me. Um, and I would hope that no active faithful member would feel like I'm condemning them at, at any moment. I I understand um, their position. I understand it well. I see um, the problems with you know, whatever. I'm not necessarily the problems. I see the way they see my situation um, as a problem. I see the, the whole concept of the Holy Ghost there. Um, I, it just doesn't satisfy um, where I'm at. And that's maybe it's because I'm past feeling, but I'm no longer trusting feeling. I still have the same, you know, what I would consider spiritual experiences. Um, you know, I, I went to that fireside and we sang hymns and I love, I love music. I love to sing. Um, and I had that experience. I had, and I've, whatever. Um, I still have spiritual experiences. I still have good feelings. I just, I just chalk those up to nice feelings. So with regards to that letter and everything else, I, I think it's great. Um, I think um, that the entire experience, it moved the ball in the right direction. I think that uh, he has shown that even after, you know, whatever happened in our conversation in the fireside, he's still um, humanizing me. He's reaching out to me. He is mm -hmm. seeing my needs and he's trying to meet me where, wherever I am. Um, my stake president, uh, our relationship, 
um, from that moment till today um, has not suffered. Uh, he still, again, he still treats me with dignity and kindness and respect. Um, these are the only two people on the planet that know how I feel um, right up until this um, came out. Uh, and, and those relationships weren't damaged. And so I'm, I'm optimistic in, in that area. Um, you guys, when you talked with Dan McClellan, um, he shared uh, a concept um, that's not unique to him, but he just talked about holy envy um, as a as a concept of religions. And he talked about how he, he he talked about how he experiences holy envy toward Judaism, and and I share that holy envy. Um, you know the the concept of the LDS Church, uh, the imagery, the metaphor is a tent. And that's where the phrase stake comes from, is that, you know, each stake in the church is signifying the growth of this massive tent. Um, I would hope that uh, the future, I'm optimistic that the future of this church is a tent big enough um, that someone like me who can go through this and, and come out the other end non-literal can mm -hmm. still be accepted within the community, um, the receiving fellowship, you know, if not if not the you know the sacramental ordinances, at least the fellowship of the community of um, of the LDS, you know, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, I, and and I and I'm optimistic that that's the direction that's going. And I think conversations like we're having, obviously, there's going to be some emotion. People are going to receive both ends. They're going to, but these are the vulnerable conversations, the messy conversations that in a family, in a marriage, in a business, if you don't have these conversations the the results are, are are pretty profoundly negative yeah these conversations are messy going in and messy coming out <laughs> the coin of not phrase. the quote i would have used but yes well hey bill do we have any people on the line who want to uh ask some questions of joe yeah we've got one and so folks please uh fill up the uh, call bank uh 662-667-6667 that's also known as 662 Mormons with an S on the end. And we'll uh, move so we your father-in-law to the head of the queue, Joe. <laughs> yeah, Kyle, too. If Kyle wants to call in, I mean, he's probably watching. Uh, if you want to dial in, Kyle, we'd love to ask you a few of these questions and get some solid answers from the LDS Church historian. Uh, who better than to answer questions on Lucy Walker and the like? If any church historian would do that, I think it would be Kyle. But I'm yeah, maybe. Okay, we'll see what happens. All right, so it looks like first one's going to be, I think, James. James, are you there? Yeah, I am. Okay, um, go ahead, my is friend. This supposed to be for, is this supposed to be for Joe from what RFM said? Is that be a question for Joe? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. Uh, I thought that maybe some people would have some questions for him. It's not totally limited to that. We were just directing it there. You might yeah, be for sorry, Radio, not, radio Free Normal. Work. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Joe. It's not for you. Apologize. Perfect. Thank um, you. So I've called you. <laughs> Sorry. So I've, so I've called before. Um, I just want to say from the outset that, that despite like how this first part will sound, I want to assure you that I trust I'm calling in good faith. Let's put that out there. Um, so in reference to you speaking earlier of um, like church leaders lying and lacking integrity and all of that, um, on your Friday night, on your Friday chat that you had with uh, Jacob, you also invited him and any of your listeners to like list three lies that maybe you've told on there since you started podcasting thing please james, didn't expect this james, to be like, hey, J james can you night. hang on a second james james i'm gonna okay, mercilessly sure. cross-examine you at this point kidding no i'm just having trouble hearing you and understanding you i think you said something about jacob and was that jacob hansen yeah yeah jacob hansen can you hear me better now yeah if you could just concentrate on just slowing down a little bit and I'm, I'll listen as oh, closely yeah. as yeah, I can. Sure. I just want to understand you is all. So go yeah. ahead, so, please. From so the he, top. I, yeah, and I think what he said, just, just so I can say this. So I had a conversation with Jacob Hansen. We're pointing out tons of deceptions that the church leaders seem to have done. And I asked Jacob to name three lies that I had given in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you were wanting to address that. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So I actually took on that challenge and came up with, a few of them, four of them, actually, since watching on Friday. Um, I mean, you say that the leaders lack integrity, they don't address that kind of thing. So I was wondering if, on the contrary, you are willing to respond to them, if you did invite it. Let's let's throw one out. 
I don't want to waste the, all the calls okay. here when we're having a great conversation with Joe, but I'll take on one. Okay. So I think, I mean, I think it's an opportunity to like let your integrity shine about the brethren. And, yeah. You know, they're not willing to hear these out, but you are. Um, and I also actually want to ask consent from RFM, as he said that, as he kind of like backed you up on the live stream chat, he said that like there's no lies from Bill. That's what he said. Okay. Are you okay, RFM? As well, RFM. Oh, you're re referencing the live okay, chat you. from that discussion last Friday that Bill had with Jacob Hansen. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm aware no of no lies. Bill, I'm aware of no lies that Bill Real has ever told. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so the one that I will say is that I called at the end of last year and asked you about like why you started um, talking about Mormonism again. Um, if you said earlier on you got burned out, yeah. your response was that you didn't get tired of talking about Mormonism, you just got tired. Like you said earlier on the podcast um, that that's exactly why you went to like the Almost Awakened podcast, so you wouldn't have to talk about Mormonism anymore. Wanted to see if you, if I'm mistaken there, if there's any reconciliation on that. Yeah, I would love to know the sources of where I said both. Um, I've been burnt out on several occasions where... Um, hey, Bill, I, Bill. Yeah, I'm sorry, maybe I'm the slow one here, but I want to represent the audience in this conversation. Yeah. For Sweet. I'm not clear at this point on what the alleged discrepancy is. So what his, so I give him one chance to pick up a, a lie that I've said in 10 years. And what he chooses to tell is that when I've given my reasoning for being burnt out in the past, in one instance, I said it was Mormonism that I was burnt out by. In another instance, I must have said it wasn't Mormonism. I was just tired and burnt out. And if that's the best you've got, um, I'll just say here that I've been burnt out at least twice where I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. There early on in the podcast, there wasn't much funds coming in. It takes a ton of time to do a podcast and you just run out of energy. Okay. And then just before RFM and Alan and Katie Mount came on board, I was burned out again. I couldn't just couldn't put out episodes all the time and you have to constantly produce stuff. So it's a combination of the work and the effort it takes to do all of this. And at some point you start to think like you've covered everything and there isn't anything left in Mormonism. And then Radio Free Mormon comes along and suddenly you start finding things all over again, new stuff. So it's actually sort of both. And that wasn't a lie at all. Uh, and if that's the best you got, then how about we go to my list of like 172 things that church leaders have lied on? Um, I, I honestly think that's sort of ridiculous. I'm, I want well, to add well, to I that. Well, I will. You asked for the sources. Hey, James. I James. Would say, um, Can you see, James, episode. how that's ridiculous? I think you're also maybe the same. Are you the guy that called before about the 990 form? Well, yeah, I said I called before. So I said it was yeah. episode 109. You're, you're episode constant. I don't know what your motive is. I don't know what it is, but you're constantly a distraction, and you don't really want to address anything that's actually talked about in terms of what the church is doing. You pick apart these little things, and you come off looking ridiculous. So are you willing to look at those episodes then? Wait, you're still wanting to go to the sources of how I got burned out twice. No, no, no. The the discrepancy where, one, you said that you wouldn't have to talk about Mormonism anymore. Um, you went to that podcast, you wouldn't have to. But then you said later that, no, I just got tired. But that you It wasn't that you didn't want to talk about Mormonism, you just got tired. But then earlier you said... You did a podcast, so you didn't have to talk about Mormonism. So that's so, is not saying that you yeah. don't want to talk about it anymore. Is there any possibility it's both? Is there any possibility that at times I've been burnt out, just exhausted, and at other times I've run out of material and wasn't interested in talking about Mormonism for a moment, and then suddenly, again, RFM, Marriage on a Tightrope comes along, and suddenly I'm interested in Mormonism again because I'm finding new things. Like, I'm just telling you, man, if that's the best you got, I look so damn good in front no. of the church. I look so good. Well, so at this point, you, you I'm, no, no, at this point, I'm going to let you go because you're ridiculous. So you don't want to hear the other. Well, I'm that disappointed. Was I didn't, I didn't get a chance to ask him whether he knows the Lafferty's or is a member of their group. That's the best he had. He had a chance to go research. <laughs> RFM, he researched for weeks trying to find lies that I've given in 10 years. And, and I said, you, I said, I'll give you one. Go ahead. Pick your best one. Yeah. And that's what he had. If this was a debate between whatever both sides and you represent 
your side and he represents the other. At this point, I would give all of your remaining time to him. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need to say what much What was going to be the second one? You know, like what was his next best one? Yeah, you'd hope that he came out guns blazing. I don't know. Wow. But I, all, all I was going to say, Bill, is that you've also forgotten this fact. Is that even after I came on board, you got burned out. I'd like to think I had something to do with that. No, you were burnt. I mean, you were doing your Mormon discussions. We were doing stuff together and uh, you got burned out on Mormonism and you were gone for several months. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the creation of this program that I thought brought you live and me back up because suddenly we were finding new things all over again. I love it. And I would say Alan Mount's amazing. Wow. You referenced him and his help. Love the guy. Yeah, See, I caught Mount's you in amazing. another lie there, Bill. You cracked under my cross-examination. Look at that. Oh, There oh. was another time that you were burned out, and you didn't mention it. This was our 990 guy. I kind of figured it was. Yeah, it was a good guess on your part. I think the critical part is that you did not mention when you got burned out that you saw Heavenly Father as well as Jesus Christ. Oh, but eight years later or 12 years later or 22 <laughs> years later. A little first humor. Yeah. First vision humor. That guy, that guy is, that guy is really wanting to get at it, isn't he? He's stretching. He's, I think he's stretching just a little a bit, a little bit for that. Just a little bit, James. Just a little yes. bit. How about this? Next time you call James, use your real number. Don't call anonymously. How do you know it's not his real number? Because when I go into the call bank for this, it comes up as anonymous. He will not let his phone number be seen. Oh, okay. So from here on out, folks, by the way, I will never share your phone number, at least not on purpose. We did have one time where a number went on the screen, and I've learned my lesson. If you want to call, use your phone number. I'm not going to take anonymous phone calls because that's just weak. Wow. Okay. All that's right. too bad because this way you can't call him back like I did with Justin and make a new yeah. friend. And he could apologize to me for stretching us on for 10 minutes on nothing. All right, folks, right, let's see. Uh, let's get the next call. Uh, looks like it is Crystal. Crystal, you're on the line. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Hi. Awesome. You're on I'm Mormonism good. How Live. Are you? I'm doing so good. If I was any better, there'd be two of me. Good. Hey, I just have a quick, well, two things really quick, if that's okay. Please. First off, with the person lying about everything, it drives me crazy because they demand 100% honesty from you and the stuff that I told my bishop and that is like fucking shit, sorry, shit, humiliating. <laughs> it's humiliating and they do not give that back. And I under, and my question is, is there any like downfall for the church showing any kind of transparency? Because I think they would actually gain a lot of my respect if they were just like, hey, we screwed up a lot of time and we're trying to make it better. I mean, I would never return, but I think it would show a lot of people that maybe are nuanced or a little bit just wanting truth that it would help them a lot. And I just wonder, like, what do they have to gain by continuing to lie to everybody? Great question, by the way. Um, I'd welcome your guys' thoughts. Maybe I'll share something when you're done. I don't think the church is interested in transparency. I don't think they're interested in doing anything any differently than they've done it for the past hundred years. And I still think they're sitting around at their big meetings where Jesus is not repeat, not showing up and wondering why the heck it is that things are going south when they're just doing the same things that they've always done. And I will tell them the answer for that. The answer is because you're doing the same things you've always done. And it's a new game. You need a new playbook. Otherwise, you're going to keep getting beaten. I personally, I think, uh, and I I mean, I might have some data, but not a lot. Um, I think that the church, at least, um, I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, the top 15, but I think that I think the people who are in the know are trying to do a 30-year plan. I think they're trying to change the narrative. They just don't want us knowing that it's happening. Um, they're waiting for the Israelites to die over the next 40 years. Their generations to die. They're doing it slow. Um, they everything's online. You don't have access to the changing narrative digitally. And so I think that if we looked at the historical narrative of 1985 Bruce R. McConkie Mormonism to 2050, enter whatever Mormonism, I don't think they're going to look the same. And I think it's going to be you know a frog boiled 
um, process that they're trying to go for. So I think if they tried to come out and be um, instantaneously um, transparent, um, they would be um, following in the steps of the Community of Christ, our our LDS church. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that financially, they're aware that that's such a risk that let's let's put all of our money in investments um, and let's do a slow burn. So when that transition happens, nuanced Mormons in 2050 are comfortable. I'm going to say that I think there is data to support well, and I, that. And I, other, oh, oh, Crystal, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that I agree with that. I think that they wait for a certain amount of members to kind of die off before they switch things just so they can kind of gaslight you into believing that this was never really a thing. But I think that a lot more people would respect them. I mean, my family is very TBM and like they know about Joe Smith marrying a 14 year old girl and like the whole money issues now with how they're hoarding all the money. And they still believe they think it's like signs of like the truthfulness of the church. And I think why do they continue to lie when they expect so much honesty from their members? I mean, Mm. the bishops that I talked to, I would be so embarrassed to see them on the street right now because of the things that I felt like I had to tell them for God mm-hmm. to love me. Yeah. And I think, what do they have to lose? I, I would have a lot more respect for them as maybe trying to do better. And I think the members that are super strong, it wouldn't affect them at all. Right. Cause it doesn't matter what you throw at them. They just say, Oh, well, it will work out in the end. Right. It will all be figured out. And so I just, I guess it's maybe in that own form of gaslighting just to continue to lie to you. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> There's such a discrepancy between like how the community of Christ in the modern last couple of decades handles this kind of stuff versus how the LDS church does. And I think LDS church leaders aren't really aware of Richard Bushman's thoughts and statements about how they have to change the narrative. Like if you constantly defend things that are just demonstrably and obviously, uh, BS and and things that are in favor of the critic and and so lopsided against a, a faithful view that if you go decades constantly trying to fluff up this stuff that just it looks awful it, and it's like this issue this issue yeah. this issue, like it's thousands of issues and as Joe said earlier like if you sit back and go like let me look at all of it and the critic has the stronger argument not just on one here or one there and not just one important one or two important hundreds and hundreds to the point where it's probably thousands of important points where on each point it almost proves the church or does prove the church isn't true. And you constantly fluff it up and you go decades doing that. And if they just keep doing it, they can, but what they're doing is they're building this repository of history where for decades they are defending the indefensible. And what they're doing is they're making a Mormonism Mm -hmm. that a hundred years from now is just going to have so much stuff that it would have been better if they would have just said today that Joseph Smith was wrong for what he was doing with polygamy instead of going like, well, let's let's redirect, let's dismiss, let's come up with bad excuses. Like it, it only adds up. And so Bushman's right. They're in a lot of trouble. Yes, and I 100% agree. I think if they were just 100% honest, they would gain a lot more in the end. But it, yeah, I guess it's good that they're not because then... <laughs> leaves people to leave but i just want to say i think you guys are great and bill i went bowling with you me and my husband i don't know if you remember me and casey oh awesome so, yeah guys are <laughs> you guys are great and i just think keep doing what you're doing and yeah, thank you we will thank you crystal <laughs> thanks for calling all in. right and when you do stuff yeah. like this i mean rfm you yeah. get this when you do stuff like this you're gonna take bumps people are gonna come looking for you but um let's do it i love it if anybody comes looking for Joe, I want to hear about it. Let's see here. By the way, you um, might want to check underneath your car when you drive home tonight. Thanks for the good advice. Becky, are you there? I'm here. Go ahead, Becky. You're on Mormonism Live. Okay. I got to shut this off. Please. Thank you. Um, yep. Okay. Still not shut off. Stop. Okay. Um, I feel like the three of you guys um, are all kind of like 
beating a dead dog in a way. It's still barking. But you know, I'm I'm it's thinking still barking. about this awesome. So are my shoes. This awesome Buddhist uh, story about well clinging to the side of the river instead of letting go and floating away with with you know just letting go and floating away. Joe for sure. He really needs to let go of the roots. Let let go. I'm not I sure ain't letting about go, Becky. RFM. There is no argument that you can make to me. You no. can cite Buddha. You can cite Jesus. You can cite George freaking Washington. This dog ain't letting go of this bone. Yeah. Thanks for the advice, though. You know, I would like to, to add, um, since how my name was used, so I'm in. Um, you know, I, I do feel a, a, a sense of peace. Um, coming to a realization, changing, you know, gears and, and, you know, I said in my, in my, in my document, whatever, you know, for 10 years, this was, this was pretty emotionally difficult. Um, and, and that's true. Um, and I do feel, and we you all have seen it where people kind of graduate, um, into a new, you know, emotional place. Um, they feel healthier. And so I think in that sense, they do let go, you know, stay in the boat, stay in the boat. At some point, the boat comes to shore. You get out. Um, the boat, the boat's reached its its destination. And I think that there are plenty of examples throughout um, post Mormonism of people who have done that. Um, at least in my situation, this this conversation we're having today was timely. Um, this was brought to me um, at request. Uh, the The conversation that I had with RFM um, was not premeditated, and and I don't know what I do tomorrow. Um, but I don't have any plans on, on, you know, beating this dead dog or horse, if you'd like, um, other than the fact that I am entrenched in the LDS community, my family, my friends, my loved ones, people that I care deeply about. And so for me to completely let go um, of the idea, the feelings, the emotions associated with it would have to divorce myself from everything that I am currently um, involved in and still want to stay uh, in those communities with those people that I love. And so there's not an option of me moving across the country and starting a new life under the witness protection program. I'm, I, I'm Mormon, you know, and my loved ones are Mormon and, and that's just the way it's going to be. It, it, first off, this isn't a tiny harmless dog. This is a giant grizzly bear and I'm probably going to spend the rest of my life kicking it in the nuts. That's probably what's going to happen. Like this thing causes harm. It's, it has LGBT folks taking their lives. It has women feeling inferior. It's got people of color thinking they were less valiant in a pre-existence. It's got uh, so much harm towards people who have doubts or questions and leave. Uh, and the only thing that has it moving towards healthier perspectives is people on the inside edge or on the outside who are criticizing it and calling on it to repent. So I, I think it's a life well lived. Maven. Yes. I, everyone said all the things that I wanted to say, but I, I just wanted to add one thing, Becky and anyone else that's tempted to give this advice, whether it's leaving a harmful religion or a harmful relationship or losing a loved one or losing an opportunity you were looking for. Anytime someone is in pain about something, it's never a kind thing to say to them to let it go. People will heal on their own time and telling people to let it go is not going to help them do that. And it, it inflicts more harm. And it's, I mean, this is literally the thing that happens to sexual abuse victims in the church. They're told to just let it go, just forgive, just this, just that. And it's not an okay thing for outsiders who have not experienced the pain, um, or at least that personal pain that someone is feeling, uh, to tell them what to do with it. And so, and I just want to clarify the outsider thing. If, if Becky, if you are someone that's also gone through this, you know, I... I've, I've been deconstructing. I would never say to somebody else, 
to just leave it alone. I, that's just so unkind. Um, I just wanted to point that out. It doesn't help. Can we let Becky respond so we have a bit of a conversation on this? Uh, generally, once we all start responding, I usually hang up with the caller so they can listen off the air. Okay, so anyway, uh, Becky. By the I, way, this I'm... is the same lady who sort of condemned us and then changed her story like the last week or the week before. Remember, we kind of misunderstood her. And she said, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying something else. And Yeah, and uh, I, Maven, thank you so much for joining in. You bring a, a quality and a perspective Amen. to this program that nobody else does, at least none of mm -hmm. these other three squares. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to ask, Becky, you know, I love you dearly, but why are you watching? And no, yeah. I didn't freeze. That was a pause for dramatic effect. It's a rhetorical question. If you're telling us to let go, why are you watching the show? I don't know, but maybe we all have some introspection that we can do, and maybe that would be a good place for you to start. I don't know. So I'm just really grateful that you that you watch the show and that you watch it regularly, and I hope you'll continue to because we're going to be here to watch. We're not letting go. All right, I got two more calls in the bank, and we'll end this thing tonight. It is, um, please be Kyle. I believe, please be Kyle. No, it's not. But I've got Jerry. Jerry, are you on the line? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm on the line. Go ahead, my friend. You've got a question for Joe. Yeah, I'm just wondering what Joe, what his kind of current um, religious thinking, if there is any, or going forward, you know, belief system. Um, just kind of wondering. Sure. Um, you know, that's a that's a, a question that I haven't reconstructed completely. Um, you know, I I mentioned it briefly in the conversation that was that was aired earlier. Um, and then I got off track. I had I was riding three horses at the same time and I it was bad news. But one of the things I said was my understanding um, of Christ is built entirely on an LDS theology. The, the, the lens that I view all religions um, is the lens of LDS theology. And so um, it's, and then, you know, when you, when you start looking critically at, at source material and, and, you know, and, and uh, textual material, it, it causes a, a, a reconstruction and deconstruction of lots of foundational beliefs. Um, I hope, and I genuinely say this, I, I hope that the, the concept of families and eternities that has been presented in LDS theology that I grew up with, I hope that's what life after death is like. Um, I, I, I love the story of, of the Redeemer and of, and of, and of Christ conquering through forgiveness. Um, there's so much uh, in, the, in the shared myth that I've been raised in Christianity and in LDS theology that I truly love. Um, that being said, um, I've had to deconstruct all the way down to the fact that, you know, is, is there life after death? Um, what does the concept of matter and energy do at death? I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, if in the end I am the universe um, experiencing a moment as a mortal human on this planet, and when I die, I, my energy and particles and matter move on, then – then so be it. Um, and I, I think there's beauty in that. I, I, I really do. It, it allows me um, to appreciate the moment, appreciate the fact that this may be my only, this may be my only life. You know, when I see a sunset, that might be it. When I um, honestly experience the love of my wife or my children, this might be the only time in a never ending eternity that I get that moment. And so to not listen to my wife and not look at my kid when they're present with me, um, man, that's, that's a, that's a sin. That's a lot bigger than, than some of the sins that we consider in LDS theology. And, and one of the, uh, to be honest, one of the biggest problems that I have with LDS theology is the fact that we kick every problem, every concern into the next life. Um, we just don't deal with it right now. And, and with the time and energy that we spend away from loved ones and relationships, yeah. um, all in the sake of, I don't know what it is, but we may never get that back. And so um, if there is a relationship, if there is a loved one that you care about, man, spend that time, say those things right now. And if you're 
if this was the only shot, then you, you did it, man. You said those things. And if life continues and, and families and loved ones and those relationships continue, um, great. Uh, fantastic. Like I said, that's the paradigm that I hope for, but I'm, I find beauty in the fact that mortality may be it. Yeah. Well said. Love it. Love I too it. don't know if there's life after death. I'm just working on having a life before death. Yeah. Live each moment. Past is a memory. The future never comes. All you have is right now. Okay. Last uh, call. Sorry, we've gone a little late here. Um, Matt, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead, my friend. You're on Mormonism Live. Hey, Bill. If um, if the accusation of of being tired is what people tell you, man, I I would be so grateful. Yeah. Uh, Radio Free Mormon. Hey, I love I love this show and um, absolutely appreciate all the work you do. Um, Joe, I appreciate you coming on today and uh, being so willing to, to share what, what's been on your mind for decades of, of time. And you know, I went through a, a life of and I uh, went through a divorce, uh, the hardest thing I've ever gone through and still trying to... Um, digest it all but it, it required me to um analyze my faith and as i started doing this i you know like like you joe you, i mean you, you've been able to research read a free more but all you guys have been researching and digging into to what really is true and and um what's out there and how do we make sure that we're we're grabbing that that truth that light and Joe, this is this is really for you. What what if what if uh, Joseph proclaimed that Mormonism encompasses all truth? What if part of the Buddha faith, part of it's true? What if the Hindu faith, part of it's true? What if all of these faiths eventually will come together and and really really tell the gospel of Jesus Christ? Um, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've read up on the Buddha Isa, uh, doing his travel across India and, you know, the Buddhist monks talking about that there was a Jesus who was, uh, pra a practicing Buddha. As you start to look at Mormonism, what if Joseph did, um, really see God, the father and the son, he had multiple, um, uh, papers on the first vision. Of course, he did. What if the church history was so corrupted? Brigham rewrote everything with the help of Heber and everybody else. And there's quite a bit of evidence that there's so much of this rewritten history to fit the the demo demonic narrative of Brigham Young. But what if all of these truths are so encompassing that that they are found in the Book of Mormon, like? cycles of life and Alice 13 it doesn't talk about one earth life it talks about hey, hey, Matt. And... hey Matt yeah every time you say yeah. what if it indicates that you're adding conjecture and the most rational conclusion oh, is hold, hold on the most rational conclusion yeah. is that yes we do have some evidence for things that Brigham Young and the early leaders councils of the church did edit back into the history we also have clear evidence that is during Joseph Smith's life, his treasure digging, and the Book of Mormon, that your argument has to also deal with other things that it that it can't. It doesn't have the capability to do. And hence, your argument's really weak. And the only way you make it strong is by saying, what if, and maybe, and if you account for something or if you make some allowances. And that's just not how rational thinking works. And so you're creating a less than... What's that, Maven? I just wanted to jump in also. Just say there's, there's so many problems with Joseph Smith, like you said, with the tre treasure digging from the very beginning outside of polygamy. And what's really disgusting to me about people who take this stance is just it's just the polygamy that they really want to get away from Joseph yeah. Smith. And the yeah. only way you do that is by disregarding all of the women's testimonies. And it's the same kind of bullshit that's still happening today. This patriarchal bullshit where multiple, multiple women can be uh, 
accusing a, a man of impropriety over years and decades. And yet people like you will still say, well, but the man said he didn't do it. So, yeah. you know, ignore 10 women, ignore five, ignore 30. Just just ignore the women because they're not reliable. Their voice doesn't matter. They're just doing what some other man told them to do because that's all that women can do, apparently. And let's just listen to the one guy that I really want to think is a good guy and I want to listen to. And and if he says, nope, I didn't do it, then, you know, case closed. It's disgusting. I hate it. Yeah. I hate it so much. And I hate that this is so many people are jumping on this stupid bandwagon. Yeah. It's awful. By the way, Matt, your view doesn't account for yeah. the land deeds that we went over. So for instance, just an example, there is a whole host of land deeds and it is demonstrable that the majority of them are connected to the very women that we associate Joseph Smith having as plural wives. That's beyond the scope of what could be altered or edited. And so with the folks who take the view that you do you seem to dismiss and ignore the data that actually holds you to being wrong. Can yeah, I ask I, a follow up again, question? Hey, Matt, I, Matt, can I ask you a question? You have a, Yeah, yeah. My, my mind went to the same place that Mavens did and that Bills did, and that you may likely, you're saying all the things that sound similar to a person who is a, a person who believes that Joseph Smith did not practice polygamy. I just wanted to cinch that down and make sure that that is your position. Do you believe that Joseph Smith yeah, practiced uh, polygamy? I believe he did not. No. Okay, so we were correct in that. I, I believe the evidence. Yeah, I believe the the evidence when Joseph was alive shows that he did not practice at all. The evidence, as long as that evidence not, ignores women's voices, I'm just I'm cutting over you because that's what you're doing to all of these women. I just. I just don't want to hear it. I'm so done with yeah. this. I, I don't want to hear it. It also ignores Oliver Cowdery's statement to his brother. It ignores the land deeds that we're talking about, Maven. There's plenty of evidence that that comes outside of the things that you're able to dismiss. William forget Clay's Brigham Young. Journal. Forget the yeah. Forget the early Another edited. Expositor. Yeah. Sorry. It goes on nope. and on. But I appreciate your calling in. I will say uh, a little bit tangentially to the polygamy thing, Matt. That yeah, yeah we do have certainly evidence that Brigham Young uh, and company would rewrite church history in ways that favored their claims to apostolic succession. I went over that uh, a number of years ago. It's fascinating stuff. But we cannot allow ourselves to ignore the historical fact that Joseph Smith did the same thing. Joseph Smith rewrote his own history as well. So it's not like something that Brigham Young's the bad guy, the snidely whiplash with the long mustache, right? And twisting it and chuckling malevolently. And Joseph Smith is the angel of light and the pure guy who never did anything wrong. No, they both rewrote history in order to suit their needs. So just wanted to make that observation. Joe, did you have anything you wanted to throw in with? Um, no. No, I, I no, no, not, not you, Matt, Joe. I, cognitive dissonance. Um, really, um, you know, the mind, the mind can go to a lot of places um, to find solace and, um, and, and each journey to their own, I mean, whatever it is, but I, I can see why anybody sees something in, in the church that they really like, and it just doesn't work with something else. Mm -hmm. And in order to make those two things fit, cognitive dissonance is just, you have to start making, you know, the gymnastics, whatever it is. My only, my only logical response would be if Joseph Smith was a, a true prophet, um, as the, and the first vision is true. Uh, and then it all went south like it did in 1844. Um, then where has where was God in 1844? Where is he now? Um, he went to all the work to set up, you know, an amazing, in your view, you know, organization, and then it it just got it got annihilated. Um, and, and maybe you've got responses to that, but regardless, uh, you know, I there's there's nine billion people on the earth today, um, and I, I would I would surmise that. That if your um, if your version of truth is is accurate, and and I'm not telling you that it's not, uh, it's God's messed up on uh, his ability to to save his kids because there's not a lot out there that are aware of of your view um, that share your view. Right. Uh, and and so, like I said, I'm not saying that you're necessarily wrong. I'm just saying, man, God's got to do a better job of getting his <laughs> message to, to us. I'll tell you. Matt, yeah. I, here's what we'll do too. Um, we will, I get to pick the topic next week. 
we'll present our best I evidence. I just have one. Hold on. Just one cop. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry, Bill. So yeah. I, I know. Next week's episode, we will present our best evidence that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Great. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, looking forward to it. I, I just have one comment because you guys have been so patient with me on this. I, I actually believe God has been working with not just not just the people here, but he's working with every nation right now. I mean, this isn't some willy nilly God that's forgetting people in in Africa or India right. or anywhere. I, but Matt, can I ask you this? Do you believe that exaltation yeah. can be found only in and through the ordinances of the LDS Church? No, I I don't believe in the LDS Church. I'm not a part of the LDS Church. I'm a part of a of a of a faith of of a band of Christians, and yeah, the I Raymond believe movement. I really believe that uh, with Denver Snuffer, yeah, absolutely. yeah, okay, yeah, I figured, yeah, I know yeah. Denver. He's a friend of mine. He's a good guy. We disagree theologically, but that's fine. And I think we can, you and I, Maybe can disagree theologically, and hopefully that's fine too. We yeah. can still be cordial Maybe. and even friendly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bill, maybe you can bring on Denver to talk about the poor poor marriage. That's not what I'm hearing, Bill proposing, Matt, just so you know. I hear Bill proposing in response to what you've suggested tonight, that he's going to present the best evidence that Joseph Smith did practice polygamy as opposed to a discussion or debate. Uh, Did I hear you right, Bill? Yeah, and we've already talked to Denver Snuffer, and there's already things that he said that I completely think are unhealthy and disagree with anyway. And Matt, I'll tell you this last thing, okay? I think that this whole yeah. discussion about polygamy and Joseph Smith not practicing it, I think that I'm somewhat familiar with it. I'm not an expert, okay? But I'm somewhat familiar with it. And I think that at bottom, it is a religious discussion that's masquerading. I should say it's a religious argument that's masquerading as a historical argument. It's not a historical argument. It's mm-hmm. religious. And history is being brought in to support one's religious beliefs. That's the way I see it. Yeah. But, well, hey, thanks for calling. Uh, thanks for watching, yeah, thank Matt. You. I appreciate it. Yeah, and, I love you uh, I'm hearing about Thanks, next Rob. week's show and the subject matter at the same time you are. Excellent. And, Maeve, and I, I really don't uh, – I want to make sure, you know, I'm not trying to um, – uh, silence voices. I, uh, that's not my intention at all on that. So I apologize if it came off uh, that way. I appreciate you saying that, but you do have to do that to hold your position. So I, I appreciate the sentiment that doesn't change what's happening though. And that happens a lot too in this space. You know, people will say, I'm not, I'm not trying to be abusive. I'm not trying to be manipulative, but when you say things that are abusive or manipulative, like, the intent still falls flat. I, I do appreciate the, the connection, the bridge you're trying to build with me. Um, I, I think we're just going to inherently disagree on, on what it is that you're doing. But I do appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to let you go, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Matt. Uh, I had had next week's topic picked already. I was going to go into, um, have you ever heard of the Brother of Gideon Society? Are the, the ones who placed the Bibles? No, no, no. And then they became the Daughter of Zion Society. And then they became the Danites. Oh, yeah, the Danites, yes. right. Yeah. That was going to be next week's topic. But now we're just going to show with whatever strength comes up, because I don't know where this will go, but I know at least four or five pieces of evidence we'll bring in. Uh, and I'm sure a few folks will find a few more. And on RFM, I'm sure you'll find something this week, too. Uh, we'll put our best case forward that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. I'll start with the William Clayton Journal and the Nauvoo Expositor. Sweet. I like to focus as much as I can, without excluding women's voices, but focusing as much as I can on contemporary evidence. Yeah, I can't wait. It'll be fun. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it, and I was glad that I was able to be here for your coming out party. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and it was, a, it was a pleasure. You, you were all kind. Um, I, I'm glad that I did it. And uh, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Thank you, Steve.